Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Surprise Jab Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Ruger, surprising you with new topics every single week and jabbing you with your daily dose of UFC. And this is finally time. It is finally time. I've been waiting to record this for a while now. I've been waiting months. I've been watching the crappy UFC Apex events. I've been watching the mediocre events in Atlantic City, in Mexico City, but it is finally time for the biggest UFC event in history, UFC 300. This is your full preview and predictions episode for UFC 300. There's hardly any surprises here. It's all UFC 300 today. In fact, the surprises will probably be what I end up choosing, who I end up choosing to win and how. We're going to go into full breakdowns for all 20 26 fighters on the card, and we'll be predicting all 13 matchups as well. We're going to talk about some new UFC fights to kick off. Look at the NBA and NHL as those seasons slowly wind to an end. But like I said, this is all about UFC 300. So strap in, get ready. This is going to be one fun episode as we gear up for UFC 300 this Saturday, live at the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. So let's not waste any time. Let's get right on into it with some new UFC news. Some new UFC news. We've had some kind a couple fights announced over the past few days, which have been pretty exciting. One matchup that is not official, actually I'll say three matchups that are not official, but are rumored is UFC 303 going down end of June, uh, the biggest pay-per-view of the summer, if you will. It's sort of like the SummerSlam International Fight Week. is like the SummerSlam to WWE International Fight Week is for the UFC. And it is rumored that Conor McGregor versus Michael Chandler is going to be announced within the next three days as the main event for UFC 303. The co-main event is rumored to be Ian Gary versus Colby Covington. Crazy welterweight matchup. Ian Gary has said he has signed to fight Colby Covington. He's just awaiting Colby's uh, signature and return. And without a doubt, I can bet Colby is going to sign the dotted line for that as well. This is all but unofficially announced by the UFC as Sean Strickland, former middleweight champion, will be taking on former middleweight title challenger Paulo Costa as well on that UFC 303 card. I am absolutely pumped if that is the case. I, I really hope that that is, that is the case, but we'll see what happens. It's, it's going to be super interesting if that fight does come to fruition, as I honestly would have assumed Brendan Allen versus Sean Strickland would have been next. But I mean, winner of Sean Strickland, Paul Costa could easily fight for a title, especially against Driscus Duplassi versus Israel Asanya. That matchup is rumored to be going down later in the year in Australia. So a lot of fun stuff going down this summer. We'll see if any of those fights get announced, but we do have four official fights I do want to share. In unfortunate news, um, UFC 301, Michelle Pajero was supposed to take on Mahmoud Muradov. Unfortunately, Mahmoud did have to pull out, so the Brazilian Michelle Pajero, who is 30-11 and 11 professionally, 8-2 and two in the UFC on a 7-fight win streak, will instead be taking on Ayor Portera. Ayor Portera, 22-5 and five professionally, 2-3 two and three in the UFC, coming off a big win over Robert Vizic not too long ago. Actually, I think last month it actually was. Um, Ayor Portera actually holds a win over Mauricio Shogun Rua, former light heavyweight champion. And, um, you know, he'll be, he was originally supposed to fight Shara Magomedov in Saudi Arabia. Instead, Ayor Portera going to be fighting at UFC 301. One. Happy to see this. Michelle Pereira, I mean, he holds wins over Michael Olka, Jacek, Andre Petrovsky, and Santiago Ponzinibbio. He's Brazilian. Ayo Patera is, I think, Ukrainian. This should be a fun matchup on, I, which I think this could be a main card matchup for UFC 301. And I've heard that, apparently, if Devison Figueredo and Alex Pereira, or even Charles Oliveira, don't get that scraped up, after their matchups at UFC 301, that they might, I mean, actually, at UFC 300, I should say, that they might even try and fight on UFC 301, which goes down in Brazil. I don't know. The Brazil card is very weak. I think the UFC, when they look at it, they kind of go, okay, we're not going to make any money off of this, so you kind of need some other bigger fights, but... Michelle Pereira, Ayo Patera, regardless of where it goes down, I'm easily riding with Michelle Pereira. I mean, seven-fight win streak, and he's not even in the rankings. And I get it. Some people come into the UFC on big win streaks, but in the UFC, Michelle Pereira is probably in the top 10, almost the top five for longest win streaks in the UFC currently. Excited to see that matchup. Also announced for UFC Saudi Arabia going down June 22nd, we have a featherweight matchup between Mohamed Naimov and Melsik Bagdasarian. Mohamed Hilman Naimov is 3-0 in the UFC, 11-2 professionally. 
holds wins over Landon Kionis, Nathaniel Wood, and Jamie Malarkey, all legit tough competitors. I uh, actually got a performance in the night for one of those wins, and I'll be excited to see what uh, he brings to the table. He is to, from Tajikistan, which I know, would he be Tajikian? I don't even know what you would call that. You know, I'm from America, I'm an American. Uh, China, Chinese, Japan, Japanese, uh, if you're from Africa, usually called African. So I think he'd just be Middle Eastern or Asian, wherever they want to describe him as. But nonetheless, he's an exciting fighter. He's got good hands. He can grapple. Should be a fun matchup. Melsic Bagdasarian, 3-1 and one in the UFC, 8-2 and two professionally. Holds wins over Des Bazooka, Colin Anglin, and Tucker Lutz. All those wins have come by knockout. He's a, he's a super fun fighter. I think you know, he, his weakness is grappling, Mel Six is, and Muhammad Naimov, you know, he can strike and he can grapple, so you're either going to get a very technical kickboxing striker matchup, or you're going to see Muhammad Naimov take down uh, Mel Six over and over again, and maybe even submit him. Fun fight, though, for the prelims of uh, UFC Saudi Arabia. Announced for UFC 302 going down on June 1st, the pay-per-view, still yet to even have a main event announced. We got two new fights announced for it, though. Um, one taking place in the UFC middleweight division, the other one taking place in the heavyweight division. We head to middleweight first as Roman Kopila, 4-3 and three in the UFC, 12-3 and three professionally. Uh, we'll be taking on Cesar Almeida. Cesar Almeida fresh off his win over Dylan Budka last weekend. He, he, just won, he just fought, already booked for that June 1st card. Happy to see it. Cesar Almeida, 5-0. 5-0 and professionally, 1-0 and in the UFC, four of those wins by a knockout. Um, as for Roman Kopilov, was on a four-fight win streak, finishes on all of them. Unfortunately, lost to Anthony Hernandez, but don't hold that win against him. Anthony Hernandez is on a crazy win streak, is in the middleweight rankings. This should be a fun one, Roman versus Caesar. You're going to see striking. You're going to see a knockout. Just depends who gets it, and I honestly don't know who I got taken it. Roman's great with his kicks, and Caesar Almeida's great with his punches, so it's up in the air what's going to happen, but I would probably favor Roman Kopilov a bit more as he is younger than Caesar. Caesar is... 36 years old with only five professional fights. Roman Kopilov is in his early 30s. I believe he's 32. 32, I think he is. And he has 15 professional fights. So a bit of a bit of an age difference there, but should be a fun one. Also going down on UFC 302, this is going to be a hit or miss. A hit or miss fight, and I'll tell you that. We go to the heavyweight division for ranked heavyweights as number seven ranked Halton Almeida will take on number 13 ranked Alexander Romanov. Halton Almeida, 6-1 and one in the UFC, was on a 20-fight win streak before unfortunately losing to Curtis Razor Blades. It was very unfortunate seeing that happen, but he did it to himself. He absolutely did it to himself, got TKO'd at UFC 299, and heals wins over Derek Lewis, Jorginho Rosenstruck, Shamil Durkimov, three-time performance of the night winner. This guy is dominant, but he is a straight-up grappler, kind of one-dimensional in that. Luckily for um, Halton Almeida, his opponent, Alexander Romanov, is the exact same. Alexander Romanov, 17-2 professionally, 6-2 in the UFC. He was undefeated 17-0, but has since lost his last two matchups. One was to Marcin Tibero, where he should have won. The other was against Alexander Volkov, where he got TKO'd in round number one. Um, Alexander Romanov, not really many impressive wins. Biggest win is probably over Blagoy Ivanov. And I mean, Alexander Volkov was supposed to fight Halton Almeida on this card. Instead, he was pulled from this matchup up to fight Sergey Pavlovich, which then that fight fizzled out, so now I have no idea what's going to happen between those two, but all I know is Alton Almeida, Alexander Romanov, you're going to see a rare grappling matchup between two high-level black belts going at it at UFC 302. This should be on the main card. I'm thinking the second fight on the main card, third fight on the main card, or maybe they just throw us on the prelims, depending how stacked it gets, but fun fight nonetheless. Other than that, not too many other UFC matchups have been announced. We'll talk more about UFC 300, but I will say the one last piece I'll give you is there are some very cool customized shorts we're going to be bringing up on uh, the UFC 300 uh, preview later on as the UFC decide to give four of their uh, top fighters on the card custom shorts so we'll bring that up a bit later but we'll wait for new UFC news after UFC 300 maybe even during UFC 300 I'm surprised we're still getting uh, announcements this week you know UFC is being very very generous alrighty that's enough UFC for now I mean within the next couple of minutes we're gonna be talking about UFC 300 but we do have to check in with the NBA haven't talked about the NBA in uh, about a week about a week I'd say actually exactly a week and 
you know, the season, the season ends, I think Saturday, Saturday, I think it ends. It might end Sunday, actually. I think Sunday's the last day. I think it's either the 14th or 15th is the last day. Every single team has either two or three games left to play. And as we look at the Eastern Conference, you know, as we look at the ending of the season, the Boston Celtics the, are going to be the only 60-win team in the league, 62-17. and 17. They went 35-3 and three at home this season. Incredible, incredible, absolutely ridiculous um, performance this year. They've clinched the number one seed in the East. They've clinched the number one seed in the entire NBA. I'm excited to see how they perform in the playoffs. You know, they got Jason Tatum, Chris Stepps, Porzingis, Al Horford, Derek White, Jalen Brown. I mean, this team is absolutely low. You've got Drew Holiday on this team. We'll see if Boston can finally realize a championship. It's been, gosh, it's been, they won one in 08, so that'll make it. Gosh, I'm trying to do some quick math here. And, oh my gosh, it has been a long time. It has been a very, very long time. What is that, 16 years? Just about 16 years since they last won a championship. I'm rooting for them. I'm hoping they, actually, I'm not really rooting for them. I could really care less if the Timberwolves aren't in it. Um, I like, I think I usually say that, like, oh, I'm rooting for them because that's just my go-to statement. You know, I'd rather like teams than hate teams. There's only a select few teams I hate, and uh, the Celtics are not one of them. I honestly, you know what? Their their team is honestly they remind me of the Buffalo Bills a lot. They have good seasons and then don't do well in the playoffs. Or the Ravens. I think Celtics and Ravens an even better comparison. Jason Tatum is like Lamar Jackson. How's a comparison like that for you? As we check out the rest of the East, I mean some some surprise uh, contenders this year. Number two is the Bucks. They've clinched a spot in the playoffs, 49 and 31 currently with two games left to play so they have two games for potential to get to 50 wins four and six the last 10 isn't too pretty but they are on a little two-game win streak Giannis Dame I wish you luck in the playoffs number three team has also clinched a playoff spot and they will just miss out on 50 wins as the actually you know what if they can win their last three they'll reach 50 wins the New York Knicks are the number three seed are you kidding me 47 and 32 two game win streak as well for them I mean I'm honestly happy for the Knicks Jalen Brunson is likable Dante DiVincenzo talk about a white boy that can ball um, and I honestly I've always liked their uh, center Mitchell Robinson I've always liked that guy and when Julius Randle's healthy Man, that boy can create an impact. Number four seed is the Cleveland Cavaliers. They'll make the playoffs. It's just more of a matter what seed they fit to as four through eight are currently not all locked in. Cavaliers, though, of course, 47 and 33. They have uh, two games left, so they'll just miss 50 wins. Coming off a win the other night is uh, good for them. Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell. This team is fun. We'll see what they do. Number five seed, this team's surprising, the Orlando Magic, 46 and 34. They're going to finish plus 10 no matter what. Plus, uh, actually, they're going to finish, actually, yeah, plus 10 no matter what, as they have two games left to play, plus 12 uh, win-loss ratio. Happy for them. Happy for them. Cole Anthony, Jalen Suggs, you got Franz Wagner out there. They are a random team that just has oddly found their success and ridden with it. Number six seeded uh, Pacers. Pacers. Tyrese Halliburton is an absolute stud. They're on a three-game win streak. I don't know how they're going to do, but, you know, them and the Knicks, if that ends up being the matchup, that would be a killer series to open the first round. Number seven seed, the uh, Philadelphia 76ers, 45-35. and 35. They're on a six-game heater. They're looking to pass the Pacers. They're looking to pass the Pacers so they don't have to play a playing game. But I, I don't really know what's going to occur there. We'll see. Um, Heat are currently in eighth. They're coming off a loss the other night, 44-36. and 36. So it looks like those two teams will be playing for that number seven seed. We'll see what happens. But as we look at the play-in, it is locked in. The Bulls in ninth. The Hawks in tenth. So it looks like Chicago will be hosting. We'll see. We'll see. Chicago could lose their last three and Hawks win their last two. And they could end up hosting the Bulls for the playing game. Uh, Bulls 37-42. And Hawks 36 and 44 are going to make the playoffs with negative records. Both have been on losing streaks, but um, the top eight teams in the East all are going to finish minimum, minimum for every single team plus six, plus six, which is very good. Shows how talented they were at the bottom of the pack. Here are your teams that are going to be getting some high draft picks. Number 11 seeded Nets 32 and 48. Cam Johnson had a great year, but. Other than that, little to love. Raptors, 25-55, and 2-8 and eight their last 10. They have lost so many games out of nowhere. Currently minus 30, minus 30 games uh, win-loss. I mean, just ugh, terrible to be a Raptor. But we'll see what they do. We'll see what they do next season. They just have to kind of assess. 
Hornets somehow got to 20 wins, won their uh, last two. Uh, they've won three of their last uh, 10 games. But I'm um, 20 and 60, not a pretty season, but they just don't really have any stars. The mellow ball's been getting hurt rough times in uh actually does uh michael jordan even own that team anymore i was gonna say rough times with mj as the owner but i don't think so there will be two franchises that will go without 20 wins dare i even say they're gonna go without i mean pistons are not even gonna win uh 15 games i think wizards max they can win is 17 games wizards are in 14th 15 and 65 four game losing streak they, they have no stars they have kyle kuzma they have tyus jones i no one no one. Pistons, worst team in the league, 13 and 66. They avoid being the worst team of all time. But I mean, 10 and 40 at home. Are you kidding me? Only seven wins on the road all year. Ugh, just icky. Just icky is all I'm going to say. One and nine in the last 10, five game losing streak. Enjoy getting another top pick, though. Enjoy getting another top pick. I'm happy for them. I don't know where the lottery is going to place them, but I guarantee they get a top five pick and they'll take anyone. They'll take any help they can get. I think they need veteran presence. On the Pistons, I know as I read their player count, you got Cade Cunningham, he can't be a leader of this team. Jalen Duran, he's young. Jay Ivey, he's young. Malachi Flynn, um, I think he had a 50-point bomb the other night. He's not your star player. Oscar Thompson, he's young. James Wiseman, barely in the league. Isaiah Stewart is probably the most veteran player on the team. Um, Evan Fournier, you know, he's not going to bring in that veteran presence. You need an older player to kind of wrangle in the team. I mean, we look at teams like the Thunder, they're just an anomaly. They're not just an anomaly. And Shea, he's been doing this a while now. He's kind of the young leader they need. And even when we look at Anthony Edwards as he's kind of leader of the Timberwolves, you got Cat, you got Mike Conley. Oh, Mike Conley, a perfect player to really be that uh, veteran presence. And Rudy Gobert, he's been doing this a while. Pistons will need that, but good job on the Celtics. Good job on the Celtics. A great year and not really anything impressive in the entire league when it comes to record-wise, but a clear discrepancy between the Celtics, who have 62 wins, and the Pistons, who have 65, 66 losses. My bad. 66 losses for the Pistons. Just a big yikes. We go to the West, where things are a lot, a lot more spots are locked up. Number one seed team is currently the Nuggets. With two games left, the Nuggets are a game ahead of the Timberwolves, who are in second, 55-25 and 25 record. Three-game win streak for the Nuggets. They're looking to cinch in that number one spot. But if I'm the Timberwolves, if I'm the Timberwolves, I don't know where I want to be. I honestly don't know where I want to be. And honestly, I would not be mad if the Timberwolves got passed up by the Thunder and the Timberwolves got the number three seed for the playoffs. Because if I'm the Timberwolves, do I really want to play the Lakers or Warriors if I'm the one seed and they're going to probably be the eight seed? Do I want to play the Lakers or Warriors? And then if we're the two seed, do I want to play the Suns? I'd, I'd play the Kings. I'd be okay with the Kings. Kings won't be easy. But I would rather play the Kings and the Suns. But if we're the three seed, we'll be taking on the Pelicans most likely. I would very much like that better than any of these other teams. But like I said, we'll see what happens. Thunder in third, same record as the T-Wolves, 55-25. They're on a three-game win streak, too. A lot, of, a lot of tough matchups at the top. Um, two games remain for the Nuggets, Timberwolves, and Thunder. as they have all. Uh, they're all kind of clicked in as the top three seeds. So it'll just depend who gets the one, two, and three spot between them. But I would not be mad with a, a three spot if I'm the Timberwolves, if I'm being honest, if I'm being honest. Now, if we end up having to play the uh, Suns, because the Suns and Pelicans both have 47 wins, only a, a half game decides uh, who will uh, get the six spot. I don't know. I don't know. A lot, lot to ponder as we go down. Clippers and Mavericks are locked in. They will be playing each other in the opening round. Clippers, 51-29. and 29. Mavericks, 50-30 and 30 on a five-game win streak. 9-1 and one in their last 10. Impressive stuff from Luka and Kyrie. Dango Gafford, I'll throw in there. Even this team is fun. It is funky. And man, Clippers and Mavericks, that's going to be a banger series. Clippers are overpowered. Every time I do an NBA 2K sim, the computer like doesn't know how to process. They have Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Russell Westbrook, James Harden. So they always do good. They always sweep their series because 2K's, 2K Sim Engine's like, well, well, you have all these star players. They must be able to do good. I don't know. Pelicans are currently in six. Little two-game win streak, 47-32, as I mentioned. Suns in seventh, 47-33. They are currently in that first playing game against the eighth-seeded Kings, who are 45-34. and 34. But like I said, you know, Pelicans, Kings lose out. Kings win out. They could potentially move up to the number six spot. Locked in into your play-in spots without a doubt. You got your Warriors and your Lakers. Lakers are in ninth currently, 45 and 35. Warriors in 10th, 44 and 35. 
They will be in the play-in, so they've secured their spot. Um, Rockets will just miss out. They are 39-40, and 40, went 5-5 five and five the last 10 to kind of miss it. But if I'm the Rockets, I kind of like that. There's, they weren't going to make it far anyways. They can get a good draft pick and really lock in next season and kind of assess, you know, what do we do with Dylan Brooks here? What do I do with, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember. Is it Jalen Green? Is that their star player? I don't, see. I don't know. 12 spot, the Jazz, 13-game losing streak. They're 29-50. and 50. They're basically the Raptors of the Western Conference. Grizzlies in 13th, 20 27 and 53. They're just going to miss out on 30 wins. Yeah, tough season for them. Grizzlies in a, uh, actually, no, the Trailblazers in 14th, 21 and 58. They just, they're like the uh, Wizards. They have no stars. And the Spurs, 20 and 60. Worst team in the West, um, better than the bottom three teams in the Eastern Conference. It's just the Victor Wembanyama show. They need to get Victor some help. A good draft pick will help with that. But my boy Victor Wembanyama needs help. He's good. He's freaking good. Rookie of the year, defense player of the year. I throw him on the. I honestly throw him on the NBA all all third team. NBA all third team. He's a stud. He just has no help. He has no help. You know who Victor Wembanyama's help is? All right, Jeremy Sokan, Devin Vassell. Trey Jones, Kendall Johnson, Zach Collins, C.D. Osman. Yeah, you're going, who, Zach? Who, Zach? Exactly, exactly. And who knows if Greg Popovich, how longer he's going to be coaching. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know. But my predictions for how everything's going to wrap up. As we go to the East, I'm feeling Celtics and Heat round one matchup. That's why I feel Celtics and Heat round one matchup. I'm feeling the Bucks taking on the 76ers. I think that makes a lot of sense. Knicks and Pacers would be a banger, and Cavs and Magic. That's why I think it's going to happen. And as for what will happen um, in the first round, I mean, I know for a fact Jimmy Buckets comes out. Jimmy Butler of the Miami Heat. Something comes out of him. Something comes out of him when you uh, go into the playoffs. So we'll see if the Celtics can survive round one, but they're probably the favorites. As we go to the West, West is much more complicated. All right, first off, four and four and five, Clippers and Mavericks. I like that. If how I think everything is going to play out, I'm thinking the Thunder are going to be at the three seed, and honestly, I'm feeling the Suns at the six. Thunder and Suns round one. I really like that matchup. Um, Timberwolves at the two spot. I think they're going to wind up probably playing the winner of the Pelicans and Kings, which I'd go with the Kings. I'd honestly think the Kings and uh, Timberwolves will match up. And as for, as for the Nuggets opponent, I don't really want to say the Pelicans drop completely out of the playoffs when they're a six seed right now. But I just, there's something about the Lakers and Warriors that really speaks to me. I'm feeling Nuggets and Lakers round one matchup. I don't know. I got to make the bold predictions. We'll come back to this and see. But NBA coming to an end. The next time I talk about the NBA, could be talking about the uh, current postseason or even like our, you know, after everything's said and done. Um, as we check out the stats, you know, I'm feeling that Luka Doncic is going to end the year as the points per game leader. He's got 33.9. Everyone else is at least three three av- three points average behind him. But Nikola Jokic is probably going to win MVP. If I'm being honest, I'm being honest. I think it should be Anthony Edwards with what he's done with the Timberwolves, but that they won't reward him. DeMontis Sabonis won the year as your rebound leader, 13.8. Very impressive. Assist per game, Terry Halliburton, the only person in double-digit assist per game, 10.9. That boy can pass the ball. Field goal percentage, Daniel Gafford of the Mavericks, 72.5. Very impressive. He'll end the year with that, I'm assuming. Stephen Curry's at 345 three-pointers made. He's uh, ahead by well over 60 three-pointers. We'll see if he can get to 350. He has to make five in the two remaining games for the Warriors. Grayson Allen and uh, Luke, Luke Kennard separated by 0.6% for a three-point percentage. They're both at 45.6 and 45. Um, and blocks per game, Victor Wembanyama is up to 3.6. That boy is very impressive. Steals per game, Shai Gillis Alexander, 2.1. Darren Fox, 2.0. Uh, neck and neck. But lots of stuff to see as the uh, season winds to an end. Uh, best of luck to all of the teams. Best of luck to all the NBA teams. I enjoy the NBA a lot. You know what else I've enjoyed this season is casually following the NHL. We've casually followed the NHL all season long. When we have Jaden and Walker on, hopefully next week, fingers crossed, they'll give us a lot more NHL information. We'll kind of recap the NHL season with them. But as we do our last little check-in with uh, what teams are in and which teams are out, we head to the East. In the Eastern Conference, your wild card is locked in for the Atlantic Division. Boston Bruins, 107 points. 
they're locked in. 104 points for the Panthers. They're locked in. And the Toronto Maple Leafs with 101. They're also locked in. All of those teams, super impressive this season. Um, Boston Bruins are currently tied for the number two team in the Eastern Conference. Um, 46 wins for the Bruins. 49 wins for the Panthers. 46 for the Maple Leafs. They all have roughly three to four games remaining for the season. Um, plus 60 point differential for the Florida Panthers is second best in the Eastern Conference. Happy with what uh, they're doing. Best team in the Eastern Conference by far, and actually best team in the entire league, is now the New York Rangers. 110 points, 53 wins, only 26 losses. Impressive stuff from them. 28 and 10 at home, not too shabby. 8 and 10, 8 and 2 their last 10. Like to see that. Hurricanes are also locked in for the Metropolitan uh, Division and the playoffs in general, with 107 points, 50 wins for them on the year. Islanders are currently in, currently in as the number six seed, or will be the number three seed for the Metropolitan in the playoffs, but the Capitals, Capitals could easily pass them, only behind them by two points. Penguins sneaking up there too. Uh, Tampa Bay Lightning do have the the top wild card spot locked in. They have 95 points, 44 wins on the year. So you're going to see what happens between the Penguins, Capitals, and Islanders, and even the Detroit Red Wings. They have 84 points. Um, I'll even say the Flyers, they're at 83. You know, they win out couple of teams lose out I'd be surprised to uh I'd be surprised if they made it but that could always happen um cool stuff all around worst team in the east is the Columbus Blue Jackets they're in last only 64 points only 26 wins but might I add that they're much better than the bottom teams in the western conference so we'll see what happens here and there but uh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. My prediction, got to go with the Rangers. Rangers taking over. Should be fun to see them do battle with whoever they play, but um, Islanders, Capitals, Penguins, Red Wings, and Flyers all still in the mix to potentially make the playoffs. Islanders currently locked in. As we check in with the Western Conference, the best team in the West, second best team in the league, the Dallas Stars. Number one seed in the West, 109 points. They have 50 wins, 20 regular period losses, 9 in O. T plus 64 point differential is also a league best, and they're 9 and 1 in their last 10. Dallas, man, good stuff. Number two team in the Central Division and locked in for the playoffs is the Colorado Avalanche. 49 wins on the year, 104 points, plus 54 point differential, 38 and 1 at home. 30 wins at home, very impressive. Number three team rounds out the Central Division to lock them in for a playoff spot. 102 points for the Winnipeg Jets, 48 wins, 24 regular period losses, 6 in overtime. Good stuff for that team. Um, Four-game win streak as well for the Winnipeg Jets, keeping them in the playoff race. Vancouver Canucks, best team in the Pacific Division and the second-best team actually in the Western Conference. Uh, 48 wins for them, plus 53-point differential. Very, very good. Um, Edmonton Oilers are also locked in for the playoffs with 48 wins, 101 points, plus 60-point differential. They're on a little three-game win streak. And with the uh, Los Angeles Kings, they're currently in the playoffs for the Pacific Division. 41 wins, 26 losses, 11 of the 11 losses in OT. Um 93 points, but watch out for the Vegas Golden Knights with 92 points as they could pass them and yeah. You got the St. Louis Blues, they're at 89 points, 3 games left. They could potentially pull off a little upset and pass um the Golden Knights and Kings up, but I don't really see it. I'm seeing the Kings and Golden Knights battle down and they'll be the two teams to get a playoff spot. I don't really know. It's tough to say. Blues, looks like you're just going to miss. Wild. Wild are fourth. Okay, they are locked in for that fourth spot um, in the wild card. And when I say locked in, I mean locked in to miss. I mean locked in to miss. They're going to be, they're going to without a doubt be the second team, second team to miss the wild card, which kind of sucks because it puts us out of a good draft position. But you know what? We're pretty good at drafting as we have two of the top rook, two of the, uh, of the top five rookies in the league, I would say uh, we have the top two in Rossi and Faber. Of course, no one's catching Bernard, a uh, talent of this generation, but I'm going with the Golden Knights to make the playoffs along with the Kings. We'll just see who's in the wild card and who's locked into the top three in the Pacific. Towards the bottom of the pack, San Jose Sharks, only 45 points. 45 points for this team, only 18 wins with four games remaining. They still have a chance to get to 20 wins. I doubt it, as they have a total of 60 losses, minus 137 point differential. That's atrocious. They've only won seven games on the road all year. Two wins in their last 10 games. Just tough. Blackhawks, it's no better. Only 51 points, 23 wins, 55 losses in total, minus 102 point differential. The Blackhawks are essentially the Spurs. 
of the NHL, um, or, uh, you know, Spurs of the NBA, Blackhawks of the NHL. As you know, they got the number one pick, Bernard. You know, Spurs got Victor Wembanyama. No help for either of those guys. They're balling out as rookie of the years. Gonna win it without anyone else competing with them. And just no help. Ducks as well. They're not even going to get to 60 points, I think, on the year. They're at 57, three games left. But three wins in the last 10, you know, and 50, 52 losses in total. Just embarrassing for the Anaheim Ducks and the Coyote Slams cracking, you know, kind of middle of the pack for, you know, you're, you're going to miss the playoffs. You're not going to get a high draft pick. You had an okay year. Not going to finish positive. Wild, you know, I'll say this. 37 wins, 32 regular period losses, 9 in OT. We're going to finish the year positive. You know, even if we lose out, we'll still finish plus one in games. Um, when you look at the regular, when you look at wins compared to your regular period losses, total losses, the best we can finish is probably 500, I'm going to assume. Um, but, yeah, when it comes to the playoffs, you know, I don't really know too much. And I heard the Stanley Cup playoffs is always, you know, upsets occur more often. But I will say this Vancouver Canucks team, I've seen them all year, very impressive. I'd love to see a Canucks. And maybe, who should I throw in the East? A Canucks and Rangers, a Canucks and Rangers Stanley Cup. That's that's my prediction at the moment without looking at any other, anything else, anything else. Uh, we'll check on the stats real quick for the NHL before we get into the UFC 300. Four-year skaters and Nikita Kucherov continues to dominate in total points with 139. For goals, uh, Austin Matthews up 66, uh, 13 more than Sam Reinhardt and Zach Hyman, who are tied for second. Austin Matthews, one of the best players in the league. Um... Connor McDavid up there with Matthews. They're competing for best player in the league. 99 assists for Connor McDavid. That boy can pass the puck. He's essentially the Sage Gilgis Alexander of the NBA. Or no, the Tyrese Halberton of the NBA for passing. Um, they know how to get the ball and puck to their opponents. Not their opponents, their teammates, Zach. Ugh. Honestly, imagine if I actually edited this and... Uh, uh, removed when I said bloopers. I think it's more funny when I say bloopers. For the goalies, your top GAA goes to Anthony Stolares, goalie for the Florida Panthers. He has .31 better than the number two goalie Piotr, Piotr Kochetov of the Carolina Hurricanes. Um, best safe percentage goes to Anthony Stolares as well with a .926 SV percent. And most shutouts is still Connor Ingram with six. But actually, Tristan Jerry of the Penguins has tied him. They both have six. Good for them. Looking at defenseman, Quinn Hughes still has the most points with 91 uh, goals. Goes to Roman Yossi with 21 of the National Predators. And assists goes to Quinn Hughes with 74. As we check in with our rookies, Connor Bedard is going to finish the year no matter what with the most points. 59 most goals, probably going to Bedard with 22. But you got Marco Rossi with 21 and Tyson Forrester of the uh, Flyers, both behind him with 21 and 20 respectively. And assists, Connor Bedard has 37 Luke Hughes, Brock Faber, both have 36 trying to chase him. Uh, so, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good stuff to see. As we wind down the year, roughly three to four games left for the NHL, roughly two to three for the NBA. Um, but lots, lots to happen. Lots to happen down the stretch. I'm, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited for this NHL playoffs. And I think it's because all my buddies watch the NHL. So that's kind of what brings the excitement out for me, but we've talked about UFC news, we've talked about the NBA, we've talked about the NHL, I have no surprises for you today, all I have is your UFC 300 official predictions and preview show coming up right now, after we hear from our sponsor, which is no one, I don't have a sponsor yet, but I feel if I did have a sponsor, I'd be able to just sneak it in there perfectly, plus it'd be fun, hearing from today's sponsor, uh, I'm trying to look around my room for something, Today's sponsor is Alro Steel, which is the company my dad works for. I'm not, honestly, I should reach out to them. Hey, can you support me? And they'll be like, oh, what do you do? Um, what do you do? What's your podcast about? Is it about steel? Is it about selling? And I'm like, no, it's about fighting and sports. And randomly, I talk about conspiracy theories. And they'll be like, oh, how terrific. So I'll stop dilly-dallying. Let's get right on into it. We got 13 of the best fights you could possibly ask for on the biggest card of all time. UFC 300, I mean, it's, it's hard to even just jump right into it. It's hard to even jump right into it. Like, it's so big. It's such a massive event. Um, what I wanted to talk about first off is the custom shorts. Zhang Wei Li has some freaking Chinese warrior type shirts. She's got these uh, shorts or uh, fighter kit, if you will, for her top half and bottom half. And she, they've got these cool ruins on them, murals or whatever, ancient symbols. They look dope. 
Justin Gaethje wanted to, was debating going for like an American style one for his shorts, but decided to just go with some stars on his. They're going to be black. They look dope. I love them. Max Holloway has Hawaiian floral design on his shorts, white shorts with some red and blue uh, florals going all around him. Looks completely sick. Absolutely love it. Max Holloway just matches his Hawaiian vibe that he brings to the table. Main event, you got your Brazilian tribe that sort of, they kind of look like these like African designs that you do on trunks, but they're more Brazilian tribe-like for uh, uh, Alex Pajera, your main event. I'm excited to see them all be debuted, and they're only the four, the next four, the fifth. They're the two through fifth for um, customized shorts, of course, Bryce Mitchell customized camel shorts originally set the tone, but i um, excited to get into it. Excited to get into the UFC 300 previews. Let's just do it. Let's just get right into it with our first prelim of the night. Davison Figueredo versus Cody No Love Garbrandt. Davison Figueredo. Uh, Davison Daus de Guerra Figueredo, I should better say. I gotta remember all the nicknames for all these guys when we uh, when we announced them. We'll be taking on Cody No Love Garbrandt in the men's fly oh, bantamweight division. My goodness, I'm so used to Davison Figueredo, your men's former Flyweight champion. Um, I'm so used to him at buying that flyweight. I forget. He's in bantamweight. He's currently in bantamweight. Um, Davison Figueredo is currently ranked number eight at men's bantamweight. Your former bantamweight champion, Cody Garbrandt, is unranked at the moment. Davison Figueredo is 22, 3 and 1 in his professional career. Cody Garbrandt is 14 and 5 professionally. 5 8 to 5 5 gives Cody Garbrandt a notable 3 inches in height, but 3 inches in reach go to Davison Figueredo, 68 inches to 65. Um, both men stand in the orthodox stance for their fighting position. And this is, this is the most in depth we've ever gone on a freaking card as we are going to be just in-depth looking at every single one of these fighters. So let's kick it off with Cody No Love Garbrandt, the 14 and 5 professional fighter. is 32 years old, born in Ultrisville, Ukeriksville, Ohio. I'm sorry for anyone from that, from Ohio, but Ukeriksville, very interesting. He now fights out of Sacramento, California at Team Alpha Male, currently on a little 2 Fight win streak. Cody Garbrandt is actually um, the number 58 greatest MMA striker of all time ranked. He was the uh, number four MMA fighter of the year in 2016 and is currently the number 22 best MMA bantamweight fighter in the world. Um, of his uh, 15, 15 wins, 11 are by a uh, KO. 11, or no, 14 wins. 11 are by KO. Of his five losses, he has been knocked out four times, which I think is very notable when we talk about, you know, how how good is his chin? He's been knocked out of his uh, five losses four times. Never been submitted, uh, never gotten a submission. That's just how it goes. And Devs Figueredo, been at it a long time. He debuted in 2012. He debuted in 2012. Been a long time since then. Cody Garbrandt officially joined the UFC in 2015. Comes in undefeated um, through his first, what was it, six wins, five knockouts, um, including, or four knockouts, including a fight of the night championship win over Dominic Cruz win the Bantamweight Championship in 2016. Since that night, since December 30th, 2016, Cody Garbrandt has gone three and five was actually on a three-fight losing streak. He got finished by TJ Dillashaw in back-to-back fights, then knocked out by Pedro Munoz in one. Was able to get a crazy knockout over Hansel Sunsa in 2020. Took Rob Font to a decision and ultimately lost in 2021. After that, dropped down to flyweight and got TKO'd in three minutes by Kakar France. But 2023 treated Cody Garbrandt very nicely. Moved back up to bantamweight, took on unranked Trevin Jones, beat him by unanimous decision. Last time he fought in December, knocked out Brian Kelher in round number one. I would like to say Cody Garbrandt's back, but the only reason he's getting this fight is because it's UFC 300. Devs of Figueredo, on the other hand, this man is an absolute legend. This man's an absolute legend. One of the greatest men's flyweights of all time. Man, oh man, that we're in for a treat. We're in for a treat. The 36-year-old former men's flyweight champion fights out of uh, Para Brazil. Was born in Sao Air, Brazil. Um, now fights out of Para Brazil. 
Um, currently coming off a win over Rob Font when he made his Bantamweight debut um, back in, gosh, when was that? I think that was in December. Yes, it was in December. Um, Devs Figueiredo trains at his own gym in Brazil called Team Figueiredo. In 2020, he was named the number two MMA fighter of the year. He is currently on the world stage, number 10 current best MMA bantamweight fighter. He's currently the number six greatest MMA fighter of all time on the world's list. In 2022, he was the number 10 MMA fighter of the year. And on the pound for pound list for best MMA fighter on the planet, he is ranked number 23. Of course, that's in the world. The UFC rankings are a bit different. Devis Figueiredo, of his 22 wins, 9 by knockout, 8 by submission. He's only ever been finished twice, once by TKO, once by submission. Both times were to Brandon Mo Reno, which is honestly pretty fascinating. Devis Figueiredo made his official MMA debut in 2012 as well, same year as Cody Garbrandt, and since then is yet to slow down. Your number eight men's band to wait. I mean, where to begin? Where to begin? Debuted in the UFC in 2017. Dudes, dudes took on just about anyone. He's had fight of the night wins over your current champion, Alexander Pantoja. He's knocked out Joseph Benavides, submitted Joseph Benavides. Um, when he won the flyweight belt, he defended it against Alex Pereira, submitted him in under two minutes. Had a fight of the, almost a fight of the year in 2020 against Brandon, actually probably was fight of the year in 2020 against Brandon Moreno. Um, took on Brandon Moreno four times, first ever time. Two fighters have ever fought four times in the UFC's company history. Um, you know, ultimately in January of last year, Brandon Moreno ended the ended their rivalry, beating him in front of his hometown, Brazil. But when he bounced back against Rob Font, he used his takedowns, looked good on the feet. I'm excited to see this one. Fun fact about this matchup between Devs and Figueredo and uh, Cody Garbrandt is they were actually scheduled to fight in November of 2020 for the Men's Flyweight Championship. Cody Garbrandt did have to pull out due to an illness, and Devs and Figueredo ended up fighting Alex Perez. But I just kind of find this fascinating that this matchup was originally supposed to be made, and now it's actually going down at UFC 300. So when it comes down to my prediction, when it comes down to my prediction, I'm going to try and be analytical with a lot of these Look, Devson Figueredo is a stud. Devson Figueredo is an absolute stud. He's got power in his hands. I mean, he dropped Brandon Moreno in their third fight three times. Okay, three freaking times. This dude has power in his hands. And I mean, as we mentioned, of his 22 wins, he's got nine by knockout. Nine by knockout. Eight submissions, too. So, I mean, let's say he drops you. He could still wrap up a submission on you. But Cody Garbrandt, of his five losses, four times. He's been knocked out. And might, might I add, Cody Garbrandt has not been fighting the highest level of competition. Brian Keller, Trevin Jones, as talented as they may be, nowhere near the rankings. His last his last few losses have been to ranked opponents. Especially, you know, in 2021, he lost to Rob Font pretty brutally. Got outstruck 176 to 63 significantly. And uh, we saw Devin Figueredo last December manhandle Rob Font. So when it comes down to it, Cody Garbrandt, of course, um, of course, let me get this stipulation out of the way. This is UFC 300. There is going to be things we don't expect that will happen. There will be fighters we never thought could possibly win. We'll pull off the upsets just because it's UFC 300. There's a certain stigma that comes with these huge events where certain fighters that may usually dominate will get outclassed. Certain fights that won't be bangers on like an Apex card will be absolutely amazing here. So I just want to clarify that I'm going to probably, you know, go off of some things that may seem realistic, some things that might not seem un- that may seem unrealistic, I should say. And in reality, anything can happen. Anything can happen. It's two human beings fighting. Mistakes are prone. But what do I think is going to happen? Devs and Figueredo is going to get a round one knockout. And I just think Cody Garbrandt against Trevin Jones and Brian Keller was not facing the power that Devs and Figueredo brings, especially the last time Cody Garbrandt fought a flyweight at flyweight. He got knocked out in round one by Kai Car France in brutal fashion. So we're going to go with a little round one knockout. Um, but one thing I do want to point out is that I think Devs and Figueredo is a far superior submission specialist than Cody Garbrandt. So if he was to get Cody Garbrandt to the ground, a submission could definitely, definitely be in the card. So that's how I think we kick off the night with a little round one knockout from Devs and Figueredo. And I'm probably going to go heavy on the finishes for this card just because, just because why not? Just because why not? It's it's fun. It's entertaining. Um, but yeah, Devs and Figueredo, I predict, will kick off UFC 300 with a round one knockout of Cody Garbrandt. And honestly, I don't hate Cody Garbrandt. I like the guy, but 
We got a long way to go, ladies and gentlemen. This is only our first prelim of the night. So you can expect a lot of fun action after this one, especially with our next fight, which is, I think, a lot of people's personal favorite of the prelims as we head to the men's lightweight division as Bobby King Green takes on Jim a t a ten Miller. I didn't even know that was Jim's nickname. A ten. What a what a fascinating nickname. Bobby Green, your number fourteen ranked lightweight in the world. Jim Miller, currently unranked, but don't don't let that stop you. Jim Miller is a legend of the game. A legend of the game. Let's get into it. Bobby King Green, thirty one fifteen and one professionally. One no contest. Jim Miller, thirty seven and seventeen. One no contest. These two have had so many fights. 47 professional fights for Bobby Green. For Jim Miller, 55. Insane. Almost 100 fights combined between both these guys. Just just around over 100 fights combined professionally between both these guys. Uh, five foot ten for Bobby Green, five foot eight for Jim Miller. Bobby Green gets two inches in height. Both men, natural weight class is 155 pounds. Both have a 71 inch reach. Southpaw stands with the left hand for Jim Miller. Uh, orthodox for, with the right hand for Bobby King Green. Um, Bobby born in September. Jim born in August. And by the way, Jim Miller is 40 years young. 40 years young. Um, this dude is has been fighting for quite a while. Let's get into Jim A. 10 Miller. Jim Miller, already um, currently on a little two fight win streak. Was born in Sparta, New Jersey. Fights out of Winnipeg, New Jersey, but you'll hear the Spartan uh, come out for his announcement. He told, um, what's his face, the announcer, um, Bruce Buffer, if he could announce him as Jim Effin Miller. Of course, not abbreviating effing, but Bruce said, you know, he kind of has a reputation for not cussing, not swearing, so he's going to uphold that, but he could maybe add Jim Effing Miller. As you know, he said um, he said BMF, the baddest mother, whatever, um, belt as well. So, uh, Bruce, we'll see what he says, but Jim Miller, man, actually went to Virginia Tech, went to Virginia Tech College, um, currently trains at Sussex County MMA. Um, Jim is um, was the number 16 MMA fighter of the year um, for this year, actually. He's currently the number 16 MMA fighter of the year. How do you order have rankings out for this year. We're, we're only four months into the year. Um, he is currently the number 45 top fan favorite MMA fighter of all time. Currently the number 32 career, uh, current best MMA lightweight fighter. And on the greatest MMA grapplers of all time, he comes in at number 48. He also trains at Pharaoh's Muay Thai, which is super fun. Um, Jim Miller, 27 finishes of his 37 wins. Um, seven of those by knockout and 20 of those by submission. So Jimbo loves his submissions um, of his 17 losses, 12 of those by decision, only ever been finished five times. Um, Jim Miller, want to know when this boy debuted? Was I even born? Was I even born when he debuted? I think I was born. 2005, I'd have been three years old when Jim Miller uh, debuted. And by the way, Jim Miller's first ever career loss was to Frankie Edgar. Second was to Gray Maynard. Um, Benson Henderson, Nate Diaz, Don Cerrone, Bill Darius, Michael Kessa, Diego Sanchez, Dustin Poirier. Literally, Jim Miller has only lost to greats in this sport. Jim Miller, such a talent, man. I'm so excited. He's fought on UFC 100 and UFC 200. And by the way, on both of those cards, he was able to get finishes. That is dang correct. We actually talked about that in our revisit of UFC 100 and 200. Go listen to that on past episodes of the Surprise Jet Podcast. On UFC 100, Jim Miller... Oh, why is it saying he wasn't on UFC? There he is. UFC 100, he beat Mark McDanzig. Um, oh, he actually beat him by unanimous decision. Didn't get a finish. Oh, how about that? But on UFC 200, Jim was able to get a finish. Actually, I saw the finish the other day on uh, TikTok, and it was brutal. It was freaking brutal. I mean, he beat to Corey Gami's face in the ground. A two-minute TKO. He literally just took him down and just pounded his face into oblivion. Jim is the most fights in UFC history. He might have the most wins, if I'm not mistaken. He's currently on a two-fight win streak. In 2023, he started off losing to Alexander Hernandez, which was tough. But after that, knocked out Jesse Butler in 23 seconds. And last, actually in January, he already fought this year. He brutalized Gabriel Benitez and submitted him with a neck crank in round number three. Jim... 5-1 and one in his last uh, six fights. Every single one of those wins coming by knockout or submission. Jim is a legend, but man, it does not get easy for you, Jim. It does not get easy as he takes on Bobby King Green, your number 14 men's lightweight. It'd be crazy if Jim Miller beats him. He'd be ranked. That would be such a cool moment. But Bobby King Green, just another fighter. Any place, anytime, he is down to 
fight. 37 years old, um, trains at Pinnacle MMA. He was um, actually uh, born and fights out of Inland Empire, California. How about that? Um, Bobby Green is currently the number 14, current best MMA lightweight fighter in the world, you know, so their rankings match up. The worldwide rankings match up with, uh, this is all according to Tapeology, by the way, very notable source, them and Sheerdog, some of your best sources to go to for MMA information, so... His, uh, him and the UFC's rankings match up. Um, he's currently the number 95 current best pound-for-pound pound MMA fighter on the planet. And he's currently the number 65 top fan favorite MMA fighter. Ooh, how about that? Um, of course, Bobby Green has 31 professional victories, 11 by knockout, 9 by submission, and of his 15 losses, uh, 8 are by decision. He's been KO'd 5 times and submitted twice. Um, Bobby Green uh, was actually supposed to fight Dan Hooker in uh, December, and ended up getting Jalen Turner, who we're going to talk about in just a moment, and Jalen Turner, unfortunately, brutally TKO'd him very badly, which I think will play a big implication in this fight, but I just wanted to add is that Bobby Green has been fighting since 2008, since 2008, Bobby King Green has been going at it, fighting these guys, I mean, come on. Come on, and him and his dad, he's actually adopted, and he has one of the best relationships with his dad. It's very inspiring, but I'm sorry to tell you, Bobby, it's not going to save you in this one. It's going to be a tough battle. Bobby Green uh, debuted in the UFC in 2009, so just a year after his debut, he was already fighting in the UFC. I mean, this guy has beaten James Krause, Pat Healy. He's fought in Dustin Poirier, Edson Barbosa, beaten Clay Guida, beaten Lando Venata, lost to Alpha Z, beaten Eli Quinta, lost to Islam Makhchev, lost to Drew Dober, beaten Tony Ferguson, beaten Grant Dawson, um, and unfortunately lost to Jalen Turner last time out. One thing I'll add for this is this is what comes down to my decision is I'm picking a lot of these fights to end by finish, and I know for a fact they're not all going to. If they do, that'd be crazy, but I am going to go Jim Miller by decision. So Jim Miller's my official prediction. Why? I just think Jim Miller, like, he knows the stakes here. He, first off, he says he's not retiring. He says he's not retiring, but he is. He is 40 years old. He's fought on 100 and 200. He has five finishes of his last six fights. Dude dude is a fan favorite by far. Might even be the only fighter to not win a championship to be inducted, or not even fight for a championship to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And he just kind of brings a stigma with him. Like, you just feel like he's going to win. You just feel like he's going to win. And another thing is Bobby Green got very, very badly KO'd by Jalen Turner last time out in December. It was a late stoppage. He took a lot of unnecessary beatings. I mean, he got hit hard and dropped. Fight came and stopped. He ate so many follow-up shots. Even the commentary is going, this fight needs to be stopped. And it is a quick turnaround after getting knocked out four months. Jim Miller did just fight in January, but he won. He submitted Gabriel Benitez. And I would not be surprised if Jim Miller got a knockout in this one, got a submission, but we're going to go for a decision. You know, we got to spice it up. Some of, the, some of these fights are going to end in decision. So that's our prediction, but just uh, just be aware. Just be aware of Jim Miller getting a finish in this one. Jim Miller's a legend. You know, I'm rooting for him, and we'll see what happens. But Bobby King Green, don't sleep on him. He's got hands. He's got hands for days. Next up, we get our first women's fight of the evening, which everyone was criticizing. You know, I, I won't lie when I saw it. You know, I was a bit skeptical. This should probably be the opening fight of the night, you know, level-wise. But these two women are both still absolute killers and are entertaining. We go to the women's pound for pound. You have number 11, Jessica Andrade. Okay, she's currently ranked number 4 at women's strawweight and number 5 at women's flyweight. She is ranked in two weight classes. This fight is being contested at... Uh, uh, straw weight, uh, as she takes on number six ranked Marina Rodriguez, another killer, always been on the verge of fighting for a title. This should be fun. Jessica Batascada, Batascada, interesting nickname. Andrade will take on Marina Rodriguez. Jessica Andrade, 25 and 12, holds so many UFC records for women. Like I'm talking submission wins, knockout wins, fights in the UFC, uh, championship fights. I mean, she holds so many. Marina Rodriguez, 17, 3 and 2. 5'6 uh, to 5'1 gives Marina 5 inches in height and also gets 3 inches in reach, 65 inches to 62, an orthodox stance for both of these women. I also find very uh, somewhat notable. I do find that pretty notable. Let's check in with Marina Rodriguez, number 6 ranked woman strawweight in the world, 36 years old. Um, fights at uh, her affiliation is CT Thai Brazil Floripa. She was born in Beige, Rio Grande de Sul, Brazil, and fights out of Florianopolis, Santa Catrina, Brazil. Uh, her foundation style is Muay Thai. Her head coach is Marcio Malco. Hmm, I've heard that name before. She's currently on the world stage, number 8 current best female strawweight, number 35 current best pound-for-pound -pound female MMA fighter, and in 2021 was the number 19 fighter of the year. 
Hmm. Of her 17 victories, she has 7 KOs and 1 submission. She's only ever been finished by TKO once. And that was actually against Amanda Lemos, who finished her in, uh, when was that, 2022 or 2023? When she beat her in a main event. Very dull main event, I might add, but... Uh, majority of her wins have come by decision. Nine. Nine of them by decision. Uh, Marina Rodriguez debuted in 2015 and didn't lose her first professional bout until 2020 when she lost a split decision to former champion Carla Esparza. So Marina Rodriguez has been fighting for quite a while. In recent history, she was on a little four-fight win streak, including holding wins over uh, Mackenzie Dern and Jan Chayonen. Mackenzie Dern recently just fought. Uh, Jan Chayonen, of course, fighting in the main event. Against, uh, not the main event, the co-main event against Zhang Wei Li for the women's strawweight belt. Um, but, you know, she lost to Amanda Lemos in 2022, lost to Vera Jandaroba by decision in 2023, did come back last September 2023, brutally TKO'd Michelle Warson Gomez, outstruck her 70-13 to 13 significantly, brutalized her, bloodied her, so guess what? She's getting the big shot here against Jessica Andrade, Jessica Andrade, Bate Estatka. I have no idea what that nickname means. Definitely Brazilian for something like Brazilian. Like, I kill people. Brazilian. That type of energy. Um, 32 years old. Um, she was born in Umaruma, Piranha, Brazil. Now just fights out Piranha, Brazil at Piranha Vale Tudo. Hmm, very, very cool. Um, she's currently the number five best female strawweight in the world on the worldwide rankings and the number nine current best pound for pound female fighter on the world rankings. 11th in the UFC. Of her 25 victories, 10 KOs. Eight submissions, seven decisions. Of her 12 losses, nine times she's been finished. Five by knockout, four by submission. Somewhat, somewhat, uh, somewhat, you know, notable there. Uh, she is 16 and 10 in the UFC, made her professional debut way, way, way back in 2011. So she's been fighting for quite some time. And Jessica Andrade, I mean, former woman's straw weight champion, might I add, beat Rose Namajunas for the belt. Got knocked out by Zhang Wei Li. Tried again against Valentina Shevchenko in 2021. Got uh, knocked out there, but she's fought in a who's who of women in the UFC. Her current uh, bantamweight champion, Hakua Pennington, she owns a win over. Okay. Um, Angela Hill, one of the greatest women in the UFC, holds a win over her. Um, holds a win over Claudia Goodella. Uh, multiple times she's fought Rose Nami Yunez. Um, beating Amanda Lemos, beating Lori Murphy. Uh, she did go 2 and 3. Last year, so she was very busy. Capped off the year with a round two knockout of Mackenzie Dern at UFC 295. Dropped her four times in that fight, but before that, she got finished by Tatiana Suarez, Jan Chayonen, and Aaron Blanchfield, which I do find very notable. Look, Jessica, very talented, very good. I got a good feeling she could win, but we gotta pick some underdogs. We gotta pick some underdogs. Cody Garman's the favorite. Jim Miller's the favorite. We got to go with an underdog. And right now on the betting line, minus 115 for Jessica Andrade, plus 135 for Marina Rodriguez. I'm not a betting man, okay? I don't have money to gamble. But if I was, this would be a great spot to put down a little underdog bet, a little underdog bet. So we're going to go with Marina Rodriguez, despite all the times Jessica's been finished, despite the finishes that Marina's gotten. We're going to go with Marina Rodriguez by decision. Another decision win here. As you'll note in a second, we're going to go on a little streak of a lot of finishes, especially once we get to the main card. But I do just have a feeling that this will be a bloody fight. I, I do see a finish in the cards for either of these women by TKO, by TKO, a little standing TKO. But Marina Rodriguez is just who's really speaking to me. You know, I'm, I'm, really, hearing like, I'm really hearing like, hey, Zach, I'm going to win this fight. And I'm like, Marina. I'm listening. I'm listening to you, Marina. Um, she's also got the height, you know, reach, reach, maybe not so much, but that height always does kind of play into advantage. As you know, she'll be punching kind of level with where her arms are. Meanwhile, Jessica Andrade has to throw them over hands to kind of get up to her. She has to throw up, but she's beaten taller opponents before. We'll see what happens in this one. We go to our fourth bout of the evening, and... My guess they just get better. They just get better as we go up. We head back to the men's lightweight division as number 13th ranked Hanato Money Moicano takes on number 10 ranked the Tarantula Jalen Turner. Oh my goodness. Jalen Turner, 14 and 7 professionally. Hanato Moicano, 18, 5 and 1. 6, 3 to 5, 11 gives Jalen 4 inches in height. He also has 5 inches in reach. 77, 72 southpaw stands for Jalen. Orthodox for Hanato Moicano. This is going to be a good one. 
This is going to be a good one, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pumped for this one. Who should we start with? Let's start with the number 13th ranked, Hinato Moekano. His official nickname isn't Money, but he kind of said that one of his uh, post-fight uh, interviews, and it's just stuck. It's just stuck with me. Hinato Moekano, 34 years old, um, fighting out of uh, Coconut Creek, Florida, was born in Brazil. Um, trains that American top team. This guy is this guy's legit as they come. Um, he's currently number 10 best MMA lightweight fighter on the worldwide rankings, of course, in the UFC, yet to break the top 10, but he could be soon. Of his 18 victories, 10 submissions. Of his five losses, three KO losses, one submission loss. I do want to note that. Three of his five losses are by KO. This guy is the type of guy to take you to the ground and try and submit you. That's just that's as simple as it comes. That's his game plan. That's his game plan. I'm like Connell. Been fighting since 2010. Been around, been around a fat minute. And, you know, he, he's very good submissions. Very good submissions. Like I said, 10 of his 18 wins by submissions. And the UFC alone, I mean, this guy holds how many submissions? One, two, three, four, five. Five submissions? Six submissions. All of them by rear naked choke. So Likes to get you to the ground, likes to take it down there. Now Moicano currently on a little two-fight win streak, 4-1 and one in his last five only losses against Rafael Dos Anjos in March of 2022. And as we look at his losses in the UFC, I mean, let me just read you these guys. Brian Ortega, former title challenger. Jose Aldo, former featherweight champion. Chan Sung Jung, former featherweight title challenger. Rafael Fazeev, who's currently, where, where's Rafael at right now? You're number eight men's lightweight in the world. And Rafael Dos Anjos, former lightweight champion. Money Moicano's only losses are to killers. And by the way, of those four wins he's had in his last five, three by rear naked choke. Got a big win over Drew Dober back in February. So a quick little two-month turnaround for him. Could play a little bit of implication. We'll see. Moicano, he's fun on the mic. He's getting a personality, getting the fans behind him. But, oh, man, it is no easy task as he takes on the Tarantula, the freaking Tarantula, what a name, the number 10-ranked Jalen Turner in the UFC lightweight division. Jalen Turner is 28 years young, 6'3", as I mentioned, very tall, very tall. Um, born born in San Bernardino, California, fights out of San Bernardino, California, trains at Carlson Gracie Riverside. Real fun little gym for him there. Um, on the world on the uh, worldwide rankings, he's currently number 9, best MMA lightweight fire, so very, very even. Of his 14 victories, 10 KOs, 4 submissions, gives him a 100% finish rate. Oh my goodness. Of his 7 losses, 4 by decision, 3 by knockout. And, you know, I think never being submitted is also something notable because that's going to be Moicano's game plan. And just he's yet to work, yet to work against Jalen Turner. Jalen Turner been fighting professionally since 2016. He's been in the UFC since um, 2018. Actually, used to fight in Bellator. He's fighting Bellator, which I find pretty fascinating. He's very fun. Seven and four in the UFC, and you may see that and go, oh, seven wins, four losses, pretty even. But Jalen Turner, I mean, of his, of his, I mean, just oh my gosh, where do I even begin with him? Where do I even begin? His last three fights knocked out Bobby Green in December. Has had a banger against Dan Hooker at UFC 290 last year. Lost by a close split decision against Matus Gamrot last year. Lost a very close split decision. Both of those could have gone to him. Before that was on five-fight win streak. By the way, all of his wins by finish. Um, only, only ever time he's been finished in the UFC was to Vicente Luque in 2018 when he fought at welterweight. Okay, before, other than that, lost to Matt Favola in 2019. This, guy, this guy's good. This guy's good. Jalen Turner. He's got the reach. He's got the height. Great at striking. Moicano's weakness is getting knocked out. His strength is submissions. Jalen Turner, amazing at knocking out, has finished all of his opponents that he's ever beaten. You know, he's just, it's Jalen Turner. We're going Jalen Turner. Jalen the Tarantula uh, Turner is our prediction. And guess what? Guess what? I've realized I've gone two decisions. We're back to the knockout gang. Round two, we'll say. Round two KO for Jalen Turner. I think Moicano tries to get him up against the cage a bit. And, you know, Jalen Turner, he's definitely gassed out against Hooker and Gamrot. He's definitely gassed out. But when he can get finished within the first two rounds, it is over for you. So Jalen Turner, round two knockout. It's called me. I've answered. That's what we're riding with. Should be a banger. Should be a banger fight, might I add, too. Excited for it. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. This is one of those fights where, you know, like I said, UFC 300, this could be the first time Jalen Turner doesn't finish opponent. This could be the first time that Moicano gets a knockout victory. It's it's very tough to see. It's very tough to see what will happen. 
I'm uh, I am uh, I am rooting for uh, Jalen Turner though, but uh, I'll be sad because I kind of like Moicano. He's kind of fun. Let's keep it moving. We head to the men's featherweight division up next as number thirteenth ranked takes number thirteenth ranked. I'm sorry for jumping over my words. Number thirteenth ranked Sodiq Youssef takes on the unranked man who was just added to EA Sports UFC five. Diego Lopez and Diego Lopez has taken the UFC world by storm for just how exciting he is how exciting he is um super Sodiq Yusuf 13 and 3 professionally Diego Lopez 23 and 6 511 to 59 gives Diego two inches in height he also has one inch in reach 72 to 71 both men stand in the orthodox position let's start off with Diego Lopez where do I begin with this kid where do, where do I even begin with this kid first off just add to UFC 5 everyone loves him 29 years old He's had 29 professional fights. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me, man? That is, that is absolutely ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. I'm here for it, too. I'm also, I'm here for it. Um, born in Manos, Amazonas, Brazil, he now fights out of Puebla de Zaragoza, Mexico. Trains at Legacy MMA and also trains at um, Brazilian Warriors. Hmm, how about that? He's currently the number 18 best MMA featherweight fighter in the worldwide rankings. Um, of his 23 victories, 9 KOs, 12 submissions. Yeah, 21 of his 23 victories have been by finish. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Get me get me a hold of this guy. Get me a hold of this guy. I want to meet him. I want him on the podcast. I love Diego Lopez. He's got so many crowds behind him. All, all sorts of fan bases love this man. Debuted professionally in 2012. Just got into the UFC last year. So he's a newbie. He's a newbie to the UFC scene. But, I mean, when you have 21 of 23 victories by finish, you're going to attract some attention. Fought on season five of Day White's Contender Series in 2021, and that was a competitive bout against Trey Anderson Brito. Lost by unanimous decision in May of 2023 after you know not making the UFC, getting some wins. On short notice, he stepped in at now the number five Mosfar Evlov featherweight in the world. Took on him on short notice, had a fight of the night in his debut, and almost beat him four separate times with submissions in that fight. Mosfar Evlov looked human when before he had looked on inhuman. After that, in August, triangle arm bars Gavin Tucker in a minute 38. After that, November, knocks out Pat Sabatini in a minute and a half. Are you kidding me? Three UFC fights, three bangers. This guy is so legit. I don't even know what to do with him. I don't even know what to do with him. He's just, he's so likable. He's so funny. He rocks like this weird mullet. I don't even know what you want to call it. But Diego Lopez, you're one of my favorite fighters in the UFC. His opponent, Sodiq Yusuf, I hate to say it, I love Sodiq Yusuf too. It kills me. It kills me, especially after his last fight, you know, lost of one of the fights of the year to uh, Edson Barbosa. I think it was my best Apex fight of the year in my official end of year rankings, but let's check in with Super Sodiq Yusuf first, 30 years old, born in Lagos, Nigeria, now fights out of New Carrollton, Maryland, trains at Team Lloyd Irving, um, bu- 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 bum, number 12 current best MMA featherweight fighter, so very close to his UFC ranking. Of his 13 career victories, six knockouts, one submission, and he's only ever been finished once in his entire career. So, I mean, this just doesn't really lose often. And Super Sodique debuted in 2016. So him and Diego Lopez, this matchmaking is absolutely amazing. Might add some very good matchmaking. Um, No, debuted in the UFC, went in on Day Wentz Contender Series, came in in 2018, gets a two-minute knockout. Very impressive. Started out his UFC career perfect 4-0 before running to Arnold Allen and losing a close decision. He was losing a close decision. After that, followed up with two wins, including he got a submission win on my birthday in 2022. Had one fight last October, of course, a fight of the year against Edson Barbosa. Almost finished him in round number one. Almost knocked him out in round number one, might I add. Edson eventually came back after round two, but just one of the craziest things. Almost knocked Sodiq out. So what you can expect from this fight between Sodiq Yusuf and uh, Diego Lopez is Action right off the bat. Sodiq likes to get it going now, right away. We've seen it in his last two fights, okay? Submitted Don Chanis in under 40 seconds, just went on him, got the submission. Against Edson, blitzed him, almost knocked him out, but Edson Barbosa, one of the greatest of all time, not easy to finish. Diego Lopez, same thing goes for him, all right? He likes to get fights going. I mean, against Mosvar Evlov, you know, Mosvar Evlov's a grappler, and not really like a grappler who finishes. So Diego, you know, he started out every single round, you know, kind of going after him. He got taken down multiple times. But another thing I want to point out is that in his career, I mean, you know, Diego Lopez's wins have come in round two, round three, a lot of round ones, a lot of round one finishes here and there. Anything can happen. 
Anything can happen. You know what? I'm riding the hot streak here. I love Diego Lopez. And just from what I've seen, Diego Lopez's last two fights, his blitzes have worked. You know, he is a great guard, great triangle chokes. He throws up great arm bars, knee bars. And so Deke would probably bring some more power than uh, Diego Lopez. But Diego Lopez has a bit in height, a bit in height that could play to his advantage. But I'm riding with the momentum. I'm not going to say Sadiq doesn't have any momentum, but Diego, the fans are behind him. The UFC is behind him. Give me Diego Lopez round one submission. And another reason I'm choosing round one submission is because Sadiq Yusuf has never been submitted. We got to go for some first here on UFC 300. We got to make it exciting. These prelims, by the way, all free. You can watch it. You don't even have to pay for the pay-per-view to watch. I'm so thankful I have like 10 buddies that I'm going to be watching this with. So it's only going to cost us like eight bucks, nine bucks each to really buy the pay-per-view. So thank goodness. But we're riding with Diego Lopez, who doesn't have a nickname yet. My boy, Diego, if you want a nickname, I can give you one. How about Dangerous Diego Lopez? Too original. Too original. I don't like it. I don't like it. Let's keep our prelims um, moving, and we have a debut fighter in the UFC. That is dang right, ladies and gentlemen. We head to the women's bantamweight division, and this division is desperately in need of someone new. To spice it up, who better than that? Who better to do that, I should add, than Kayla Harrison? Kayla Harrison joins the UFC, and she'll take on Holly, the preacher's daughter, Holmes. Holly Holmes, currently the number five woman's bantamweight in the world. Is she still on the pound for pound rankings? No, they booted her from the pound for pound rankings. How sad. How sad for the former women's bantamweight champion, Holly Holmes. Holly Holmes, 15 and 6 with one no contest. Kayla Harrison, 16 and 1. 16 and 1. How about that? Um, UFC has no stats for Kayla Harrison. Um, so I guess I'll have to guess I'll have to use um tapeology to get my stats on Kayla Harrison here. I'm pretty, pretty torn by this. 5'8 for Kayla Harrison, 5'8 for Holly Holmes. They match up very well there. 69 inch reach for Holly Holmes and a 66 inch reach for Kayla Harrison. So three inches in reach for Holly Holmes. Both women do stand in the South Paw stance. South Paw stance for fighting. Let's start off with Kayla Harrison. Kayla Harrison is a former, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure she's won a gold medal or something. She's like a black belt in judo. or She, she is ridiculous. 33 years old, born in Milltown, Ohio, and now fights out of Coconut Creek, Florida. Trains that American top team. Was a PFL champion. Of course, any uh, MMA fans know what the PFL is. Probably the second or third or fourth best MMA organization in the world. And she absolutely ran that division for quite some time before, uh, unfortunately, losing to Larissa Pacheco. Getting one more win over Aspen Ladd and then saying, you know, basically saying, see ya, see ya, I'm leaving the company, and she decided to sign with the UFC, and she's debuting at UFC 300, which is going to be absolutely electric, and the women's bandwidth division is desperately in need of someone new, so Kayla Harrison will add that excitement of her 16 wins, 6 knockouts, 6 submissions, that's right, 12 of 16 wins are by finish, her only ever career loss is a split decision, so, you know, a split decision is her only career loss, that's not too bad, last fought in uh, November, Got a decision win over Aspen Ladd, former uh, women's fighter in the women's fan division, actually. So, Kayla Harrison, she's fun. She's legit. You know, she, she's much more of a grappler. She's much more of a grappler, and a lot of those wins have come from ground and pound TKO. Um, but she's also great with submissions. Also very good with submissions. And there was that one point where I think she had finished every single opponent she had fought in the PFL. It was pretty crazy. Um, excited to see her debut, but she will have no easy task in front of her as she takes on the preacher's daughter, Holly Holmes, who is 42 years old. 42 years old, nine years older than Kayla Harrison. Um, actually went to college at the University of New Mexico. She fights out of Albuquerque, New Mexico at Jackson Wing MMA. Same gym as uh, John Bones Jones, actually. Um, her foundation style is boxing. You know, she's a boxer through and through. A lot of stats for you here. Number five MMA fighter of the year in 2015. Currently on the worldwide rankings, number 14 best pound-for-pound -pound female fighter. Uh, currently the number uh, five best female fighter in the world. Matches up with the UFC rankings. And the number 60 greatest MMA striker of all time. That's quite a, that's quite a list to make. Of her 15 victories, Eight knockouts, eight knockouts. Um, never, uh, never gotten a submission win. You know, seven wins by decision. Of her six career losses, um, four by decision. You know, she's been knocked out once. She's been submitted once. Other than that, not too much. And look, 
Holly Holmes has done it all. She's participated in Muay Thai and kickboxing, a lot of boxing, but MMA is where she's really um, gained some notability. You know, had her first professional MMA bout in 2011. You know, joined the UFC, was undefeated, became the first woman ever, first woman ever to beat Ronda Rousey did in her third UFC fight. Um, after that, you know, not too much success. Lost the belt to Misha Tate with thir- a minute and a half left in a fight she was winning. After that, lost to Valentina Shevchenko. Was then given a fight for the woman's featherweight belt against Jermaine Durandamy. Lost that in a boring decision. Um, picked up some wins here and there. Fought, um, actually, um, what's her name? Chris Cyborg for the woman's featherweight belt in December 2017. Lost that in a fight of the night. Um, picked up some wins. Um, actually fought Amanda Nunes for the belt in July 2019. Got knocked out in round one. I'm just they, they, They've just given her so many title shots. Um, in recent history, last year beat Anna Santos, just grappled her to a decision win in 2023. And then in July, fought uh, Mara Bueno Silva, got submitted 30 seconds into round number two, but that fight was overturned because Mara Bueno Silva tested positive for some drugs that she shouldn't have been taking. So Holly Holmes kind of coming in off a loss, even though it's not officially on the record. Uh, before that, I mean, just nothing really exciting. Nothing really exciting. So in reality, she should probably be on a five-fight unbeaten streak. You know, she had an unfair split decision loss to Kelton Vieira, which should not have gone her way. Uh, so I'll be excited to see what happens in this one. But I'm just, I'm just going to note this here is that I like when a division's boring and a new fighter comes in that can really shake it up. So I think even if I may think that Holly Holmes will win, I got to go with Kayla Harrison. I got to go with Kayla Harrison. We got to get her in the band point rankings, have her fight for the belt. And unfortunately, I don't see her finishing Holly Holmes. I really don't. But like I said, if she does, I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised. I'm going to go a decision just because I like to throw in decisions on my card. It makes it more realistic when I kind of look back on my predictions. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to go with. I think Kayla Harrison's grappling is far superior to Holly Holmes. The boxing may be in favor of Holly Holmes, but don't forget, she's 42. Kayla Harrison is 33. She's fought the Olympics, ran the PFL for years. Her only career loss is to a woman she had beaten three times before, all right? Basically, her Israel Asanya, Alex Behera. So, um, Kayla Harrison, I'm excited to welcome you to the UFC. I know some people are kind of pissed, like, oh, a woman's fighting this card. Nah, I'm rocking with you, Kayla. Happy to, happy to see you fight. Happy to see you fight. Alrighty, let's get into our next one. This one's good. I mean, they're just all good. They're just all good. I mean, when do they get bad? They don't get bad. Our second to last prelim of the night could be a its own fight night. This could be a fight night main event. And honestly, all these could be fight night main events. If I'm being honest, we head to the men's featherweight division as number eight ranked Calvin Cater welcomes the currently ranked number two Aljamain Sterling, former men's bandweight champion, moves up in weight to take on number eight ranked Calvin Cater. Um... Excited to see this. Aljamain Sterling, the funk master, 23-4 and four professionally. Calvin Cater, 23-7. and 5'11 to 5'7 gives Calvin Cater four inches in height. Also has one inch in reach, 72 inches and 71. Both men do stand in an orthodox stance when they are fighting. Let's start with the men's former bantamweight champion, Aljamain Sterling, of course. Lost to Sean O'Malley last August, got knocked out in round two. He's back. All right. He's hungry. He's he's elected. You know what? He said after the Sean O'Malley fight, it would be his last fight in the division. And that was true. He's trying to make a run at featherweight. I don't really know what will happen if he loses. But you know what? Let me just give you a little background on the Funk Master. 34 years old. Trains at Sarah Jiu-Jitsu. Of course, best buddies met Rob Dweva Shelley. Um, born, was born and fights out of Cortland, New York. I mean, this guy is um, wrestling. Wrestling is on a whole nother level. He was uh, the number eight MMA fighter of the year in 2022. Uh, and uh, he's currently the number 15 best MMA bantamweight fighter in the world. Um, you know, still on there. Number 17 current best pound-for-pound pound MMA fighter in the world. Actually, is he still on the pound-for-pound pound rankings? Let me, uh, no, they actually, yeah, number 15. He's currently number 15. So that matches up. Number 28 greatest MMA grappler of all time. Number 62 greatest MMA fighter. Of all time. How about that? Of his 23 victories, three submissions, uh, or three KOs, eight submissions, 11 of his 23 wins by decision. Yikes. Of his four losses, two by decision, two by knockout. Two by knockout. Two brutal knockouts, might I add. Um, loves doing grappling tournaments. Really is just a... Really, he's just an all-around fun fighter. Really, he's just an all-around fun fighter. Aljamain Sterling, he's been at this MMA game since way back in 2011. 2011, man. That is absolutely crazy, if you ask me. Um, debuted in the UFC in 2014. Wow. 
Um, start off um, his UFC career going 6-2, and two, both of those losses, split decisions, before getting brutally knocked out by Marlon Moraes with a uh, knee to the head. After that, went on one of the craziest nine-fight win streaks I've ever seen. Um, had a Suvlov stretch against Cody Stammen, one of only two times in UFC history. Um, submitted Corey Sanhagen in a minute and a half to get a title shot. Of course, won the bandwidth title over Piotr Jan with a legal knee. Defended the bug against Piotr Jan in a close split decision. Beat TJ Dillashaw, who only had one arm. Then beat Henry Cerudo in another close split decision before losing to Sean O'Malley. Osman Sterling is a great grappler. His only path to victory against Calvin Cater will be his grappling. So we'll see if that can help him. But uh, we check in with Calvin. Cater, the Boston finisher, as he's labeled, 36 years old, born in Lawrence, Massachusetts, now fights out of Methuen, Massachusetts. Of course, trains at New England Cartel with other members like Rob Font, who we've mentioned, um, head coaches Tyson Chartier. This guy is fun. This guy is just a fun fighter. Number 10 current best MMA featherweight fighter, so pretty close to his UFC ranking. Number 55 top fan favorite MMA fighter, and is currently the number 82 best pound-for-pound pound MMA fighter in the world. Of his 23 victories, 10 knockouts and 3 submissions. Of his 7 losses, he's only ever been finished twice, once by TKO, which wasn't really, he injured himself, and then once by submission, which wasn't even in the UFC. Calvin Cater, he's been fighting since 2007. 2007, bro. I was five years old in 2007. So, like I said, I like to pick unpredictable things sometimes. You know, as much as I like to be predictable, I say I like to be predictable, but I like to kind of pick the unpredictable. So, wait till you hear my prediction for this fight. But, Calvin Cater, um, some of the crazies you've seen knockouts you'll see over Shane Burgos, Chris Fishgold, uh, Ricardo Lamos, Jeremy Stevens. This guy's a killer. He, um was landed the most significant strikes in UFC history on by Max Holloway in January of 2021. He came back in January of 2022 and did the exact same thing to Giga Chikadze, brutalizing his face. In recent history, June 2018, lost an unfair split decision to Josh Emmett. That just, just, he did not lose that fight. And then last fought in October of 2022, unfortunately injured himself eight seconds, hurt his knee against Arnold Allen. So it will have been over a year since Arnold Allen last fought. I mean, not Arnold Allen, since Calvin Cater last fought. Um, so it's very unfortunate to see. We'll see if he's fully healed. I mean, usually when he takes a good year off, he comes back better than ever. I don't know about this time, but I mean, you know, he's a, you know, he's a fun fighter. He's a fun fighter. And what I'm going to do here, what I'm going to do here is obviously um, Calvin Cater is a striker. Calvin Cater likes to knock people out. Aljamain Sterling likes to grapple you. He likes to bring you down to the ground, submit you, okay? Not really a striker. So what are we going to say is going to happen? Well, on Verdict MMA, just updated, absolutely love it. Calvin Cater has 130 times XP, which is essentially like 130, like a like a 13, he's plus 13,000 to get a submission or something. And Aljamain Sterling rarely gets submitted. You know, if anything, he's getting knocked out. So the obvious prediction here is Calvin Cater to get a knockout. But guess what? Aljamain Sterling, I think, takes Calvin Cater down in round number one. Calvin Cater wraps up a guillotine, rolls over on top, and submits Aljamain Sterling in round number one to shock everyone. A shocking round one submission from Calvin Cater. No one's going to see it coming. No one's going to see it coming. I'm not going to see it coming. You're not going to see it coming. I'm going to be shocked it came true. But if we're talking about realistic things here, I think Calvin Cater's power is going to just one good straight shot to Aljamain Sterling's chin. He should be put out. I mean, Aljamain, he's struggled with Henry Cejudo striking. He just got knocked out by Sugar Sean. Obviously, he can take down Calvin Cater. He should have success. I would not be surprised with how high level. I mean, he's a former bantamweight champion, for goodness sakes, defending the belt three times. This should be competitive. Love that this matchup is happening, but I'm going to ride with Calvin Cater. But Aljo, Aljo, I don't hate you at all. I don't hate you at all. Alrighty, we get into our final prelim of the night. This is only the prelim, ladies and gentlemen. This is only the freaking prelims. It's how loaded this is. And we have the number two light heavyweight in the world, Jiri Prochaska, taking on the number five light heavyweight in the world, Alexander Rakic. Oh my goodness, it's so good. I can't believe this is on the prelims. I cannot believe this is on the prelims. I just feel like I'm being spoiled. Dana White has just spoiled me. I'm such, I've been such a good boy. Jerry Prochaska, 29-4-1 professionally. Alexander Rocket Rocket, 14-3. 6-4 to 6-3 gives Alexander one inch in height. Jerry has two inches in reach, 80 to 78. Um, Jerry Prochaska, we actually share the same birth month of October. Alexander Rocket recently had his birthday in February, turned 32. Good for you, Alexander. Good for you. 
Who should we start with? Who do we want to start with? Let's start with the Rocket. Alexander Rocket. He is a fun fighter. Um, he is 32 years old, as I just mentioned. Born in Austria. Trains out of Vienna, um, Austria. His foundation style is Muay Thai. Muay Thai. He has not fought, though, since May 14th of 2022. So him and Kelvin K are kind of in the same boat. Currently the number six best uh, MMA light heavyweight fighter on the worldwide rankings and is currently the number 98 best pound for pound MMA fighter on the worldwide rankings. Of his 14 victories, nine KOs and one submission. Um, of his three losses, he's lost once by decision, once by submission, and once by KO. But that one TKO loss was he hurt himself last time he fought in May of 2022, and that's kind of what happened. That was against Jan Blahovic, who's actually originally supposed to take on Jan Blahovic at a UFC 297 in January. Jan had to pull out due to injury, and so he in, in steps Jerry Podoska, who will take on him against, uh, against him at UFC 300. Um, Alexander Rakic debuted in 2011, lost that bout by a uh, split decision, and uh, actually, no, he lost that by submission. He lost his debut by submission, and after that, went on a ridiculous, like, 12-fight win streak, I think it was, and uh, since then, just been on an absolute roll. I mean, he's had some crazy knockouts of Devin Clark and Jimmy Manuwa. Um, only lost, uh, really, in the UFC was by Volkan Osmer by split decision. He obviously beat Thiago Santos and Anthony Smith in 2020 and 2021, and that fight against Jan Blachowicz, you know, they were, you know, Jan won round one, and then Rakic was winning round two, was winning round three, before he obviously hurt his leg. Oh, it's the legs. Legs always will get you with them injuries. Um, That was a competitive fight, but he's back, man. He's back. I'm excited to see Rakic back in action. He's a fun fighter. He's just, he's, he's such a likable guy, too. He just brings the energy, fights for Austria, where, where reps his flags proudly. But unfortunately, Rakic... You know, whereas Calvin Cater is, you know, you know, not necessarily the best uh, best opponent. So Aljamain will have a good entry into the featherweight division. Um, unfortunately for you, Jerry Prohaska will not make this series easy for you at all. Jerry BJP Prochaska. This man is an absolute murderer. 29 4 and 1, as I just said. 31 years old. Born in Hosteradice, Czech Republic. Now it's fights out of Bjorno, Czech Republic. Trains at Jesame Jim Breno. His head coach is Jaroslav Hovizek. I just love saying all these names. But me not. He's currently in the number four best MMA light heavyweight fighter on the worldwide rankings. He was the number 11 MMA fighter of the year in 2021. Currently the number 20 best pound for pound fighter on the world rankings. The number five MMA fighter of the year for 2022. And is the number 12 top fan favorite MMA fighter of the year. Of his 29 victories, 25 submissions, uh, tw sorry, 25 knockouts, three submissions. Um, of his 29 victories, 28 finishes. This guy. This guy does not leave his opponents around. No, no, no. Um, three and one currently in the UFC. I mean, Jerry Pohaska been fighting professionally since 2012. He is so fun. He is so fun. I mean, I cannot get enough of this guy. I cannot get enough of this guy. Um, of course, last time he fought Alex Pajera in uh, in November, lost that fight in round number two, got TKO'd. But he'll be back. He'll be back. I got a good feeling about it. I got a good feeling about him in this one. And like I said, I compared him to Diego Lopez. Four fights in the UFC, all have been bangers. All right, debuted against Volkan Ozmir. Put him out cold with a punch in 49 seconds. I'm talking Volkan went to sleep in the ring. After that, May 2021, puts out Dominic Reyes cold in round two with a swing back elbow. In June of 2022, to win the light heavyweight championship, he submitted Glover Teixeira with 28 seconds left in a fight he was losing. In a fight he was losing. Of course, the Alex Pajero loss was tough. You know, I think Jerry made some mistakes in that one. Plus, we all know how good Alex Pajero is, for goodness sake. So, you know what? I think Jerry can bounce back from this. He's got the power. Rockets hasn't fought in a while. I do think the chin will, you know, kind of be shocked to take a big punch, especially from Jerry Pohaska. Rockets is much more of a grappler. Rockets will probably lean some more on the grappling, so don't be surprised if Jerry gets taken down. But Jerry is not your normal fighter, right? He's throwing up submissions. He's throwing elbows all the time. He's crazy. I think it's going to give the technical Rockets a bit more trouble. And, you know, and Jerry wasn't really fully knocked out in that loss back in November. I don't think he took too much head damage in that one. I think Jerry will come back and he'll get his classic round two knockout. So Jerry Prohaska, I think, wins this one and could maybe even take on the winner of the main event. We'll see. Round two KO for Jerry Prohaska. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me recap my prelim predictions for UFC 300 before we get into this electric main card. Kicking us off, Davis of Figueredo, Cody Garbrandt, 
I got Devin Figueredo with that round one knockout punch. Jim Miller, Bobby Green, anything can happen, but we're saying Jim Miller wins by decision. Josh Cunn draws Marine Rodriguez, same thing goes. Marine Rodriguez by decision, but could get a knockout. Jalen Turner, Money Moicano, round two knockout for Jalen Turner. We'll see if Moicano can even survive round one. Diego Lopez, Sodic Yusuf, I'm saying this one's like a barrel out of a cannon. Round one submission, these two are going to go right at it. Kayla Harrison's debut against Holly Holmes, I'm seeing a Kayla Harrison finish, but you know what, we're going to go with a decision because it's the safe bet. Calvin Cater, Aljamain Sterling, my craziest prediction, which I got to predict something that just no one ever think of, Calvin Cater, round one submission. Uh, and Jerry Prosca against Alexander Rock. It's been, been way too long, been about a year and a half, almost two years, since Alexander Rock, closer to two years. It's been over, it's been... Two years in May, all right, since uh, Rockets last fought. Give me Jerry, bro, Haska. All righty, let's not waste any time. We're keeping this moving. The main card gets kicked off, and it's just starting with a bang. It's just starting with a bang. We just, we don't stop. Can't stop, won't stop as we head to the main card of UFC 300, and we get it kicked off with a fun, fun matchup. All righty, two unranked fighters. Two unranked fighters, I know. The, the the booking of Bo Nickel and Cody Brownage on the main card is not smart, but the UFC has basically said, we're going to put Bo Nickel on every main card of every pay-per-view he's on, which, you know what, I'm not going to be a hater, because you know what, I like Bo Nickel. Bo Nickel, 5-0 and professionally, Cody Brundage, 10-5. and 6'1 to 6 foot gives Bo 1 inch in height. He has a notable 4 inches in reach, 76 inches to 72. Bo throws the left-hand southpaw, Cody throws the right-hand orthodox. Very, very fun. Let's start off with the worst fighter on UFC 300, Cody Brundage. He's being put in this position to be squashed. The 29-year-old born in Chaplin, South Carolina, now fights out of Inglewood, Colorado, trains at Factory X Muay Thai. Head coach is Mark Montoya, and he actually went to Newberry College. I don't even know where that's at. He's truly number 55 best MMA middleweight fighter on the planet. Hey, you know what? Better than the number 56 guy. Of his 10 victories, 5 knockouts, 3 submissions. Very cool. Um, Of his five losses, he's been knocked out twice and submitted once, which I find very fascinating. Uh, Perfect 4-4 and in the UFC. Um, Cody Brundage debuted in 2019, so this is only year five fighting for him. Um, Basically, all of his losses have came in UFC promotions. And Cody, you know, is being fed to Bo Nickel here. He's being fed to Bo Nickel. It's obvious. It's obvious what they're doing. But, I mean, Cody Brundage has kind of shocked people before. Um, debuted on uh, season four of New Mexican Contender Series, got knocked out in two minutes. After that, took on a short notice, Nick Maximoff lost that. But then followed that up in 2022 with round one submissions of Dolce Lucambula and round one knockouts of Treshawn Gore. Then got knocked out by Michael Kujasek in 2022. Then in April last year, got submitted by Rodolfo Vieira in a fight he was winning. After that, lost a boring decision to Cedric Dumas, but in September, managed to get a DQ in over Jacob Alcoon. Obviously, very controversial. Obviously, you know, Jacob was winning, landed one accidental elbow. I mean, this guy was just throwing relentlessly 28 to 2 in the four minutes this went. He was getting brutally outstruck. So he won that by DQ. And then in December, he was supposed to be fed to the young Zach Reese. And instead, Cody Brundage got performance that night, slam KO. He picked Zach Reese up, who had him in an armbar. Dropped him on his head, and he got TKO'd. That was one of the craziest. KO'd, I should say. Not even TKO'd. He was knocked out cold. One of the crazy things I've seen. Cody Brundage has shocked people before. You know, he's being put in this position to be destroyed by Bo Nickel on the main card. We'll see if he can rewrite the history that is going to be written. But guess what? It's no easy task as he takes on Bo Nickel, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. Penn State legend, NCAA legend, has broken so many records. He's wrestled at the United States. I mean, he's represented the world. This kid's a killer. 28 years young, born in Rifle, Colorado, now fights out of uh, Pennsylvania, United States, actually at uh, Penn State, Penn State College. He actually fights out of the state college town around Pennsylvania. Of course, trains an American top team as well, along with Penn State. Wrestler, wrestler, through and through, and he's currently the number 34 Best MMA middleweight fighter. And he's only had five professional bouts. Are you kidding me? Five professional bouts. They've all ended in round one. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm being dead serious. All ended in round one. The longest fight he's ever had, two minutes, 54 seconds. Besides that, three of those have ended in under a minute. And uh, yeah, the one against Zach Boyago on his Contender Series debut made it two seconds past a minute. Dude's an absolute killer. I mean, just 100% finish rate. 100% finish rate. Bo Nickel knows what he's doing. Um, last year, debuted against Jamie Pickett. Submitted in round one. Last fought in July. 
TKO Val Woodburn in 38 seconds. Um, Cody Brundage, you're going to get fed to. He's got to reach. He could knock you out. I'm predicting he submits you, though. Cody Brundage's weakness the last few fights has been his takedown. So, Bo Nickel takes him down, submits him in round one, all, all in a day's work at the business office. By the way, this will be the biggest upset in UFC history if Cody Brundage wins as Bo Nickel is nearing the plus 5,000, plus or minus 5,000, um, uh, uh, odds on the betting lines. He's minus 2,000, 5,000. He's 3,000. He is one of the greatest favorites in UFC history. So Cody Brundage, try and rewrite history at UFC 300, become a legend. I, I don't think you're going to, but you know what? Anything can happen. Anything can happen, guys. And, um, oh man, my tone of voice is changing. My tone of voice is changing a bit because I'm a, I'm a little worried. I'm a little worried. My most excited for fight on this whole card is the second fight in the main card. And I have tears in my eyes. I have tears in my eyes because I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, guys. Okay? There's my heart and then there's logic. Okay? And as we head to the men's lightweight division, number, wow, number four ranked Armin Sarukian takes on number one ranked Charles Oliveira. On the UFC's men's pound for pound, Charles Oliveira is ranked number seven. Your former men's lightweight champion, Charles de Bronx Oliveira, one of my favorite fighters of all time, Takes on Armin Ahakalats Sorukian, the killer from Armenia. Oh my gosh, the killer from Armenia, I mean. He is, oh man, these two are so good. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Let me just break it down for you. Let me break down the fight for you before I start losing my mind. Charles Oliveira, 34 and 9 with one no contest. That's right. This dude has had almost 50 professional fights. He's an absolute killer. Um, Armin Sorukian, 21 and 3. He's only ever lost three fights. Good, good for Charles, though. Uh, three inches in height, 5'10 and 5'7. Okay, two inches in reach, 74 inches, 72. And both men stand in the orthodox stance. We shall begin with the young up-and-comer, the killer that is Armin Ahakalats Sarukian, 21 and 3, as I mentioned. 27 years young, one of the youngest fighters on this card. Um, born in Armenia, now fights out of Kranznodar, Russia. His foundation style is freestyle wrestling. Trains at Khabarovskov MMA currently on a three-fight win streak. He's on the worldwide rankings, number six best MMA lightweight fighter, the number 41 top fan favorite MMA fighter, the number 32 current best pound-for-pound pound MMA fighter, and is number 66 on the greatest MMA grapplers of all time. Main gym is, of course, Kabaraskov MMA, also trains at Tiger Muay Thai. Okay, of his 21 victories, nine KOs, five submissions. Armin's a killer. Armin's a killer. That's all I got to say, man. Eight and two in the UFC. I mean, he is he is on a whole nother level compared to everyone else. Debuted professionally in MMA in 2015. Um, lost his second ever bout in 30 seconds to Alexander Belik. You know what he said after that? I'm never going to lose again. He's lost two fights in the UFC. He's lost two fights in the UFC. Guess what? One was his debut when he took on Islam Makachev, your current champion on short notice. Lost a close split decision. I mean, he almost beat Islam Makachev in his debut. That was five years ago. Since then, went out a five-fight win streak, including knockouts of Joel Alvarez and Christos Gagos. Lost the decision to Matus Gamrot that he should have won in 2022. But since then, followed that up with win over Demiris Magulov, a TQ of Joachim Silva, and most recently, in December, to make himself even more inevitable of becoming champion, he knocked out Benil Tariush in a minute cold. I mean, he slept him cold. The main event had just begun, and he knocked him out. Armin Sarukian is just a killer, an absolute killer. He can grapple, he can strike, he can kick, he can submit, he can do it all, all right? Who is going to stop this man? By the way, love you, Armin. Absolutely love Armin Sarukian, but there's a man I love more. There's a man who was specifically crafted to crush Armin Sarukian, and his nickname is Da Bronx. That is right, Charles Oliveira. Let me give this man a proper introduction. 34 years old, born in Guadalajara, Sao Paulo, Brazil, in the favelas. He was poor. He is now a millionaire. Find now Sao Paulo, Brazil at Shootbox Diego Lima, your former men's lightweight champion, Charles Oliveira. Like I said, he's on the men's uh, pound-for-pound rankings in the UFC. He's the number one contender in the men's lightweight division. 
but there's way more than that. He was the number two MMA fighter of the year in 2021. He is the number three top fan favorite MMA fighter currently, the number four MMA fighter of the year in 2020, the number 16 MMA fighter of the year in 2019, the number 84 greatest MMA striker of all time, the number two current best MMA lightweight fighter of all time, behind the champion, by the way, number three greatest MMA grappler of all time, number five current best pound for pound MMA fighter of all time, the number 24 greatest MMA fighter of all time, and he was the number one MMA fighter for 2022. I mean, come on. What more do you want from Charles Oliveira? He has 34 34 wins. That's right. I'm getting an accent now. 34 wins, 31 finishes, 10 knockouts, 21 submissions. He holds the most submissions in UFC history. He also holds the most finishes in UFC history. 22 wins in the UFC, 9 losses. This guy is insane. Of his 9 losses, though, Eight times he's been finished. Four by TKL, four by submission. So Charles can be hit or miss sometimes. I won't lie. He was actually supposed to fight Islam Makachev at a UFC 294. Unfortunately, that got canceled. Volk stepped in. But this is all part of the plan. Okay, this is all part of Charles Oliveira's plan. He lost his belt to the evil Russian Islam Makachev. But with a win here, he can come back and win. Charles Oliveira, by the way, debuted professionally way back in 2008. 2008. Are you kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? Charles Oliveira, legend of the game. You have two finishers going out of here. And I mean, Charles Oliveira, debut in the UFC 2010. Let me read you some of the names he's fought. Darren Elkins, Jim Miller, Donald Cerrone, Cub Swanson, Frankie Edgar, Jeremy Stevens, Max Holloway, Anthony Pettis, Clay Guida, Paul Felder. Um, who else? Tony Ferguson, Michael Chandler, Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, and recently knocked out Benil Dariush in round one back in June. So how about that? Charles and Armin have both finished the same guy. And might I add, Charles did it first. He softened him up, okay? You know what? This is a tough one to tough one to say. Um, since 2017, the only man to ever beat Charles Alvera was Islam Makhchev back in 2022. Charles really makes my heart race when he fights. He really gets me going. You know, a part of me wants to pick Armin Sarukian because usually when I pick against, but you know, he when I pick against Charles, he wins. When I when I pick him, he usually loses. So I don't know what to do. I could be writing history right now with this prediction if I'm being honest, but. I got to do it, boys. I got to freaking do it. All right. Charles Oliveira, the Bronx, with a round one knockout of Armin Saruki. And if I don't pick him, I will hate myself. If I don't pick him, I will hate myself. And I know that's drastic. Zach, you're not supposed to hate yourself. You're supposed to love yourself. Well, I do love myself. And I'll love myself even more if Charles Oliveira wins. Give him to me, Charles Oliveira. Round one knockout. This is the fight I'm most excited for. I'm just, I'm jonesing for this fight. I'm just itching. My skin's crawling. And I'm just pumped. I'm just so pumped. Best of luck to both men. If Armin wins, I won't necessarily be, uh, you know, mad at him. I'll more be sad that Charles lost. But I feel much better if I pick Charles and he wins than if I uh, pick Armin and Charles loses. It's, it's you know, you got to ride with your favorite fighters. You're really doing it. I know you're not supposed to pick in any sport with your heart. But that's what we're doing. We're not betting. You know, I don't lose anything. Maybe I'll lose respect for my listeners for getting these picks wrong. But, oh, man, I just love you, Charles. Not not, not anything gay, you know. Maybe maybe a little semi-gay. I'm joking. I'm joking, by the way. No one make a clip out of that. Alrighty. Our third fight of the evening. I mean, gosh. Imagine topping the next. Imagine topping every single fight with this fight. How is this the third fight of the night as the UFC? Um, third fight of the main card, might I add. As the UFC's BMF title belt is on the line, the baddest mother effer as Justin the Highlight Real Gaethje takes on Max Blessed Holloway. I mean, come on. Does it get any better than this? Number 14 pound for pound fighter, Max Holloway. The number two featherweight fighter in the world takes on Justin Gaethje. Who is Justin at right now? The number two uh, lightweight fighter in the world. I mean, this guy is super talented. Absolutely love both these guys. This is your fight of the night. All right, let me just write this in right now. Fight of the night next to these two. If this isn't fight of the night, then uh, I'd be very surprised. I'd also be very surprised if this wasn't fight of the night. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's take a look. Justin Gaethje, 25 and 4. Max Holloway, 25 and 7. The matchmaking is incredible. I gotta give it to you. I would love to be a matchmaker in the UFC, but these guys do it much better than I could. 5'11 reach for both these guys. 5'11 height for both these guys. 70 inch reach for Gaethje. 69 inch reach for Max Holloway. So only one in separating them. They both fight orthodox. These two are so similar. They almost land the same strikes land per minute. 7.35 for Gaethje. 7.17 for Max Holloway. 
Who do we start with? Who do we start? Let's start with the former featherweight champion, Max Blessed Holloway. And I mean, the accolades for this guy just go on and on. 32 years old. He's already done so much. Born in Au, Hawaii, in the United States. He now fights out of Wani, Hawaii, at Gracie Technics. Hmm. How about that? Didn't even know that. Um, if you thought Charles Oliveira had a lot of accolades, listen to this guy. The number one MMA fighter for 2017. The number three greatest MMA striker of all time. The number seven MMA fighter for 2015. Number nine MMA fighter for 2016. Number 14 greatest MMA fighter of all time. Number 19 MMA fighter of the year for 2023. Number two current best MMA featherweight fighter. Number three MMA fighter of the year for 2021. Number nine MMA fighter of the year for 2018. Number 11 current best pound for pound MMA fighter in the whole world. And the number 15 top fan favorite. Favorite MMA fighter of all time. By the way, he's probably the number one in the UFC. This guy is so likable. You can't hate Max Holloway. You just got him. Just take his greatness as it comes. Love this guy. 25 wins to his name, 11 KOs, two submissions. He's only ever lost once, which was um, he was submitted early on in his UFC career. Actually, fun fact by Dustin Poirier, if I'm not mistaken. Let's go back and look way back in. Oh, no, it was actually to uh, Dennis Burm. No, who? It was to Dustin Poirier. He submitted him with a triangle armbar back in 2012 when they were like 21 years old. So, fun fact there. And uh, Max Holloway has also never been dropped in the UFC. He has one of the best chins, if not the greatest chin in MMA. I mean, this this, this kid's amazing. This kid's amazing. He's not even a kid. This grown man's amazing. <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying that. But uh, Max Holloway debuted in 2010. By the way, if you do your math, that would be correct. He was 18 years old when he freaking debuted. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And he was doing amateur fights when he was like 15 years old. So, I mean, um, Max Holloway, an absolute killer. Love this guy. So excited for this fight. So excited for this fight. And he's got so many knockouts to his credit. Might have had 11 knockouts um, in recent history. Um, little two-fight win streak. Uh, the only man um, to beat him that isn't named Alexander Volkanovsky was Dustin Poirier in 2019. You know, so Volkanovski is the only man to have ever beaten him. You know, he's, he hasn't been finished since 2012. Never been knocked down in his career. Max Holloway's coming off a crazy fight against Chan Sung Jung. Knocked him out back in August. And actually, back in April, beat Arnold Allen in a nice little decision win for him. So, Max Holloway, talented as they come. One of the best fighters on the entire roster. I'll be excited to see him fight. Very much so. Um, he's a boxer through and through. I mean, and I think in like his last... 10, I mean, um, his entire UFC career, I think he's landed under 10 takedowns. You know, this guy does not like to really land takedowns. He likes to punch your face and beat you up. But there's only one man who likes to beat people up more than Max Holloway, and that's the highlight reel, Justin freaking Gaethje. I mean, come on. Come on, the number two lightweight in the world, in the UFC rankings, that is. Um, 35 years old, um, born in Safford, Arizona, now fights out of Greeley, Colorado, I mean, this guy is this guy's ridiculous. This guy loves violence. Um, currently the number three best MMA lightweight fighter in the world on the worldwide rankings, that is, according to Tapology. Number eight MMA fighter of the year for 2018. Number 15 current best pound for pound MMA fighter, according to Tapology. Number 20 greatest MMA striker of all time. Number 79 greatest MMA fighter of all time. Number eight fighter of the year for 2023. Number 14 fighter of the year for 2020. Number 60 fighter of the year for 2017. And is currently the number 25th top fan favorite MMA fighter. Of his 25 victories, 19 knockouts, two submissions. Come on. Come on, man. What more could you ask for? Of his four losses, um, they've all they've all been by finish. So, I mean, Gaethje, Gaethje has only ever been in the distance four times his entire career, and all four of those times he's won the decision. So, twice he's been TKO'd, twice he's been submitted. Eight and four in the UFC. This man has made a million dollars from performance bonuses. I mean... The dude, dude's talented. Dude's legit talented. And the UFC, the only men to beat him, former men's lightweight champion, Eddie Alvarez. Former men's lightweight uh, interim champion and title challenger twice, Dustin Poirier. F one of the greatest, if not the greatest, lightweight and fighters of all time, Khabib Nurmagomedov. And former men's lightweight champion, Charles Alvarez. So Gaethje, he's only ever lost to the greats. He's so talented. He loves violence. He loves to fight. Recent history, I mean, of course, you know, lost to Khabib, followed that up with a fight of the year win over Michael Chandler, fought Charles Oliveira for the lightweight belt, lost in round one, but uh, last year, 2023, beat Hafel Fazeev in a fight of the year candidate, and then knocked out Dustin Poirier with one of the greatest KOs of the year, a head kick knockdown, a minute into round one, Gaethje's coming in with fire. So let me start this off. Let me start this off. I'm picking Justin Gaethje. I'm picking Justin Gaethje, okay? I am picking Justin Gaethje, but I am going to say decision. 
I'm going to say decision because every single time I think a fighter can finish Max Holloway, they never do. So I'm hoping the one time I predict Gaethje to win by decision, he gets a knockout. Gaethje has so much power in his hands, so much power. I mean, he has landed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven knockdowns in the UFC. By the way, in all but two fights, He's gotten a fight of the night bonus, and in those two fights he didn't, his opponent did, okay? So, I mean, this guy's legit coming in with a ton of momentum after that Dustin Poirier win. I'm thinking Gaethje could be the one to not only finish Max Holloway, but drop him, you know, drop him with a little knockout punch. It's UFC 300, anything can happen. I am sleeping on Max, I know this, but... We're up in weight. Max has been fighting that featherweight the last four years, five years, might I add. And uh, you know, it's just it's a bit of a it's a bit of a uh, switch up when you go up in weight. You know, you're you're a bit bulkier. Maybe his chin will be a bit stronger. But Gaethje is gonna handle business. So Justin Gaethje, my official prediction for the third fight of the night, uh, third to last fight of the night, I should say, in the BMF title will be on the line. How about that? And I think they wanted um they wanted someone, Mark Coleman, I think, to drape it around them, which would be very cool. Mark Coleman, of course. Uh, doing pretty good after his uh, house fire. Fortunately, lost his dog, which was sad, but he's able to save his parents. You know what? So you got to look at the positives there. But um, with that, we get into our co-main event of the evening. Your co-main event of the night is one of our two official titles, if you will, not to diminish the BMF belt, but I mean, this is one of the two official belts of the night. As your current women's strawweight champion, Zhang Weili, takes on her toughest opponent to date, Yan Chai. Own in the first ever meeting between two Chinese women for a belt. Actually, two Chinese fighters in general in the U- U- UFC for a belt. Incredible. And by the way, Zhang Weili, the number two pound-for-pound pound woman fighter in the world. Yan Chaon in number 10, according to the UFC rankings. Yan Chaon is currently the number one contender as well. This should be a banger of a matchup. Zhang Magnum Weili um, is, of course, uh, 24-3. and three. Uh, John uh, Chon in 18 3 with one no contest. 5 5 to 5 4 gives Jan a uh, one inch in height, and both women have a 63 inch reach. Zhang Wei Li is switch stance. She's always switching up how she's throwing kicks with the left and the right. And uh, orthodox stance for Yan Chon, and she keeps it nice and simple. Let's check in with the challenger for our first title fight of the, uh, I guess our second title fight of the evening. I don't even know what to call a BMF. It's more just a fan service. Um, Yan Chaeyoun in 34 years old, born in Shenyang, Lianong, China. Uh, she now fights out of Sacramento, California. Trains at Team Alpha Male. Her uh, college, she went to Zhang Physical Education Institute. Wow, so she's smart as well. Impressive. Um, In the worldwide ranking, she's currently the number two best female strawweight, and she's currently the number 10 best uh, pound-for-pound female in the Mayfair. So it lines up perfectly with the UFC's rankings. Of her 17 victories, seven KOs, and one submission, she's only ever been finished uh, twice out of her uh, three uh, losses. Once by KO, once by submission. Nine decision wins, though. Ooh. Boring. I'm just kidding. Not to be offensive. Yan Chaonin debuted professionally in 2009. She's been at it a while. And uh, joined the UFC in 2017. Uh, went on a little six-fight win streak before running into a former champion, Carla Esparza, who TKO'd her in round number, uh, so round number two. Wow, how about that? After that, though, she was able to get some uh, wins over Mackenzie Dern on my birthday in 2022. And last year, knocked out Jessica Andrade in round one in May to get a title shot. So, Yan Chaonin, welcome to the title scene. We'll see how you do. But it will not be easy as you take on one of the greatest, if not my favorite, women's fighter of all time, Zhang Magnum Vei Li. I mean, come on. This is your woman's strawweight champion, ladies and gentlemen. She is legit as they come. 34 years old, born in Handan, Hebei, China. She now fights out of Las Vegas, Nevada at the Black Tiger Fight Club. Ooh, what a gym name. Um, she's currently the number one best female uh, pound for pound fighter on the planet, according to the worldwide rankings. Number seven MMA fighter of the year in 2019, number 19 fighter of the year in 2022. Currently the best female strawweight on the planet, and your number 10 MMA fighter of the year for 2020. Hmm. Fun facts. Of her 24 wins, 11 knockouts, 8 submissions. She's only ever been finished once in her entire career. That was against Rose Namajunas in 2021. Currently riding a little three-fight win streak. She's coming off a dominant win over Amanda Lemos back in August. And, I mean, that was just brutal. That was absolutely brutal. Uh, This will be her 11th year fighting. She debuted in 2013. But, I mean, that Amanda Lemos win, 163 significant strikes to 24. Okay, her most dominant round was the fifth round. Took her down six times. Zhang Weili is on absolute roll. The only woman to beat her in the UFC is Rose Namajunas. One man, I should say, with an A, not an E. Um, only one woman's ever been able to finish her. Rose Namajunas. That was a stunner in a minute. 
So Zhang Wei Li, of course, back at it. Love seeing her. Uh, love seeing her uh, get back to it. But I mean, this one's simple for me. I'm sorry, Yan Chaonin, but if Amanda Lemos can't do it, you can't do it. And I do think you know this will be back and forth. And I haven't seen a round three finishes yet on my official card. So we're gonna say Zhang Wei Li retains with a round three. Mm, what should I say? We'll say submission. Round three submission. I like the submissions. Plus, Zhang Wei Li is, uh, you know, she can get them. She submit Carlos Barza to win the belt in her second title defense. She'll uh, get a submission win of her own. So, there's that. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to our main event. So, uh, let's, uh, let's just get right into it. Our main event. The big shabang. The big skadoosh. As Alex Poetam Pahera takes on Jamal Sweet Dreams Hill for the Men's Light Heavyweight Championship. All will decide who was the best light heavyweight on the planet. Rankings-wise, rankings-wise, that's what we want to look at. Jamal Hill is currently the number one contender, number one ranked on the pound for pound, though. Alex Pajara, the number four pound for pound fighter in the UFC. Alex Pajara, 9-2 professionally. Jamal Hill, 12-1 with one no contest. Both men stand 6-4. Both men have a 79 reach. Orthodox stands for Alex Pajara. Southpaw for Jamal Hill. But you got to watch the hook from Alex Pajara. He catches you with the left hook. You know, you think you're going to get caught with a straight right. You get caught with the hook. Um, Let's check in, check in with our challenger, your former champion, Jamal Sweet Dreams Hill. 32 years old. Um, Fights out of Michigan. Born in Michigan. Trains at Black Lion Jiu-Jitsu Academy. Currently on a little four-fight win streak. He is the number two current best MMA light heavyweight fighter. He was the number 14 MMA fighter of the year for 2023. He was the number 11 MMA fighter for the year in 2022. And he is the number 21 current best pound for pound MMA fighter on the planet. Of his 12 wins, 7 KOs, 5 decisions. His only ever career loss was to Paul Craig back in 2021, where he uh, basically got his arm broken. He got TKO'd on the ground. It was brutal, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, that'll happen. That'll happen. Um, Jamal Hill, currently on a little five fight on beaten streak, of course, uh, got injured after uh, beating Glover Teixeira to win the belt. So he hasn't fought in over a year. Last fought in uh, January of last year. Uh, debuted in professional MMA in 2017. So, I mean, fairly new. Only year number seven for him. Uh, after only one MMA fight, actually an amateur fight, he debuted. So impressive stuff for Jamal Hill. I mean, dude has one, two, three, four knockouts in the UFC. He's impressive. He's crazy. And uh, coming off a dominant win over Glover Teixeira. Been a while since he fought, so I'll be happy to see him get back to it with his little four-fight win streak. But um, it's no easy task for Jamal Sweet Dreams Hill. And he's been so cocky in this fight camp. He's been saying this could be a walk in the park. He's trying to pull the Iotopura and put that he's the champion already in his bio. But I only know one champion, ladies and gentlemen. I only know one man who holds the light heavyweight belt. And his nickname is Poetan Chama Indeed. Alex Pahara. One of my favorite fighters. One of my favorite fighters. Number four best pound for pound fighter of the world. Your current men's light heavyweight champion. Your former men's middleweight champion. He's the first ever glory kickboxing two-time division champion. That's right. Alex Sandro Silva Pahara. 36 years old. He was born in San Bernardino, Sao Paulo, Brazil, but now fights out of Bethel, Connecticut. His foundation style is kickboxing. His head coach is Glover Teixeira, where he actually trains with him at Teixeira MMA and Fitness. They're best of buddies. They make funny TikToks sometimes. Um, Alex Pajara, number two MMA fighter of the year for 2022. Number seven current best pal for pound MMA fighter on the planet. Number 10 MMA fighter of the year for 2023. Number 58 greatest MMA fighter of all time, excuse me, number three, current best MMA light heavyweight fighter, number seven, greatest MMA striker of all time, and the number 13 top fan favorite fighter on the planet. Hoofta, I had to take a break there, Alex Pajero, make me run out of, run out of juice, um, nine wins to his name, seven knockouts, might I add that to your, uh, to your assessment of him. He's only ever been knocked out once, only ever been submitted once. He was submitted early on in his uh, little MMA journey, which he only ever began MMA back in um, 2015, um, really committed to it in 2020, and since then has been on absolute roll. Um, of course, knocked out Israel Adesanya to win the belt at UFC 280, uh, 280 uh, one it was, and then lost last April, unfortunately, but um, he was able to rebound. Come back, beat Jan Blachowicz by split decision in July, and knocked out Jury Prohaska in November to win the belt. So, you know what? Alex Pajara, you're dominant. You're awesome. And guess what? He's riding a freaking two-fight win streak into this. And of his of his UFC career, um, six and one, all but one fight, all but two fights, I might add, he's been has, he's gotten a finish in. So, 
Alex Barra. He's pretty dominant. Jamal Hill's kind of made himself unlikable this camp. He's on whining and bitching on Twitter. Excuse my language. And uh, Alex Barra, you know, he's just so kind. He goes in there. He knocks fighters out. He's menacing. He also has his custom Brazilian shorts. And guess what? I think Alex Barra walks in there. Pieces Jamal Hill up in round number one, almost knocks him out, drops him even, comes out in round two, finishes business. Round two, knockout for Alex Pajero. Lock it in, ladies and gentlemen. Go to the sports book. Tell your mother, call your grandfather. Alex Pajero, round two, knockout. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I got to go with it. I got to go with it. Alex Pajero, I'm just rooting for him, too. I'm just rooting for him, too. It's not that I'm necessarily not a hater of Jamal Hill, but you know what, Alex Pajero? He's a likable dude. He's fun. I enjoy him. So that's what we're going to ride with. Alex Bahara to retain his belt. No new champions tonight, folks. No new champions. So you ready to recap all our main card predictions? We kick it off with Bo Nickel running through Cody Brundage. Round one submission. Maybe even a knockout if we're feeling spicy. Cody Brundage could maybe pull off the upset, but we're riding with Bo. After that, Charles Oliveira beats Armin Suzuki by round one knockout. I'm not going to say more. I don't want to jinx anything, but you know what? If Charles wins, I'm a happy camper. After that, Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway have one of the greatest MMA fights of all time. As Justin Gaethje maybe knocks Max out, maybe even he gets TKO'd, but we're going to say a decision goes to Gaethje. After that, Zhang Weili runs through Yan Chaon into a round three submission. And in the main event, Alex Perra gets himself a little round two knockout. Even, yeah, I think, you know what, he's even going to land some follow-up shots. Jamal's going to get beat on his little fat chin. I'm just kidding, Jamal. Don't hurt me. You're actually a cool dude. But um, that's who we ride with. That's where we're riding with 13 fights going out of the T-Mobile Arena this Saturday. Prelims kick off at 5, 5 o'clock. So from 5 o'clock in the, I guess, night, I guess the end of the afternoon, the beginning of the night, until midnight, I'm going to be watching fights. I'm going to be watching some of the greatest fights I've ever freaking seen. So that's all we got. That's all we got, ladies and gentlemen. UFC 300, our biggest coverage show to date. It won't be this long every ever again. It'll, it'll never be this long. It'll never be this long. We've been talking for an hour and a half just about UFC 300. We had to go in depth. We had to read you all the stats about these guys. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry if, I, uh, if I'm not going to put the exact location of all the fights, but um, you know what? I, I might do that. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll be feeling generous. I probably won't. You can go and listen to the whole thing to hear all of my predictions. So with that... Ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope you watch UFC 300. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know your guys' predictions. I'll be happy to hear it. I'm going to be watching all the fights. It's going to be fun. And um, without a doubt, we will catch you next week for a little recap show of UFC 300. You can bet your butt on that. But uh, as, for, as for today, I'll have to catch you next time on the Surprise Jab Podcast. Have a great weekend, everyone.